Um, a very good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. So thank you for spending some time with us today. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Noran from University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And I'll be responsible for moderating this session today. So this is the Global, Health, uh, Global Public Health Scientific Writing Workshop. I would like to welcome everyone to our scientific writing workshop. And um, if you've been having a hard time trying to get your papers published, then you are definitely benefit from this workshop today. So we've got our eminent speakers. They will be sharing a lot of tips on how you to get your papers published. At the same time, we'll be walking you through to qualitative research and giving a glimpse of what the editors want in their journals. Now, maybe before we start, just some housekeeping rules. I would like to request that everyone be mute so to avoid background noises that may distract others from listening to the webinar. And you will also have the opportunity to ask questions. So please type in your questions if you have any in the chat uh, box and uh, you can ask questions anytime. So we'll be collecting these questions and address them during the Q&A session. Right? So let us go get started. Um, all of our speakers have distinguished career in public health. And what they have to say today is really valuable information. So I recommend that you don't just listen, but uh, take out your pen and then uh, jot down the things that it's, it, it's very valuable. So for the first speaker, it's my great honor and pleasure to invite our first speaker. That's uh, Professor Colin Bins. Uh, he is the Distinguished Professor of Public Health, School of Public Health, uh, Curtin University. He is also currently the Editor-in-Chief of the Asia-Pacific Journal of Public Health, and he has tremendous papers published um, in, in many, many reputable journals. And it is my great, great pleasure to invite uh, Prof. Colin Bins. And uh, his topic today is on how to get your papers published in the Asia-Pacific Journal of Public Health. Prof. Colin, I'll to you. Okay, Noren, can you just let us know how long you would like me to speak for? Um, uh, I think each there'll be is a three hour session, so about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll okay. get the Q&A immediately after your talk so that uh, the, the, the participants won't, won't forget, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. Okay, That's good morning, it. everybody from sunny Western Australia. Although I'm afraid I'm indoors, so you can't see how beautiful it is outside. There we are. I hope that you can all see my, my screen. I'm going to talk about writing a, an academic paper from the perspective of the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health, which of course is the journal that is owned by APAC. So it's your journal and we invite you to submit papers to it. Of course, there are three secrets to a successful academic life. And this is a carving from Japan. And they, yeah, the monkeys are actually telling us three things about academic life. First of all, papers. Secondly, papers. And thirdly, papers. In order to be, to have a successful life and be promoted, you've got to publish a lot of papers. Your papers have got to have a lot of citations and you have to publish in journals that are as high ranking as you can. When an editor looks first at your paper, they want to see that the topic is relevant to your journal. Secondly, they look at the title. It's got to be catching. In other words, it's got to be interesting. It's got to actually reflect what is in the paper and it's got to have enough detail so that the editor and anybody that is reading the index of the journal knows exactly what the paper is going to be about. And then they look at the abstract. The abstract also has got to be interesting. It's got to be well-written and it's got to include uh, some of the results. And then they go on to look at actually what you've written and the references and make a decision whether it's even worth reviewing or not. Now, in the Asia-Pacific Journal of Public Health, we this year we'll probably get close to a 1,000 papers submitted, and we will publish around about 100. So the immediate aims of writing a paper. First of all, you've got to make the editor happy, because if the editor's got a smile on his face, he or she is likely to... Uh, treat your paper favorably. 
But, of course, the real reason why we publish papers is that in public health, we are all dedicated to the health and the well-being of our fellow citizens. We want to improve our world. We want to leave a world a better place for us having been here, for us having been involved in public health, and for us doing our research. So journal editors have another important question. Will this paper increase the citation rate and the reputation of my journal? Because if it has a high citation rate, in other words, the number of people that are including that journal in their own papers, then a lot of people will want to read the journal and it will have an influence. So if we are publishing things that are important for public health in our region, we want people to read it. So the journal editors want to know whether your paper is going to contribute to improving public health. So you've got to make it easy for the editor to say yes. Now, almost all articles have the same structure. In the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health, we want papers that are around about 3,000 words long that include about 30 references. And this is the basic structure which you will find in the workbook that you have been sent. Before you start, now that's, I actually left that typo there for you because the first thing is to make sure that you don't have any obvious spelling mistakes. Read the instructions to authors. Each journal has a different set of instructions. Second thing is read articles from that journal and follow the instructions exactly. We find that people send us journals that have articles that have obviously been sent to another journal that follow the layout or the referencing system of a different journal. And then they send it to us and they expect us to be enthusiastic about it. We aren't usually. As I said before, it's important to get the title right. So the purpose of a title is to attract attention to your publication. Now I'll talk about Google a few times because this is the age of Google and other search engines and databases. Your publication has to be found by Google and classified correctly. So the title is important in that it will determine whether your paper is read. If your paper is read, it's more likely to be cited on, to be cited and to improve your ranking and the ranking of the journal. So selecting what we read as an academic, we have to read maybe tens, maybe fifties. I probably read more than a hundred articles every week. And we select those on the basis of the titles and the abstract. So it's worthwhile really thinking, talking to your friends and looking at what has been published in the journal before to make sure that you get the title right. We have keywords, usually four or five keywords that are associated with the topic of your paper. Now remember that these will become the key search words in the different databases. So the keywords will determine if your paper is cited or not. How do you find keywords? Well, you can find keywords for similar articles published in the literature, and you should look for the keywords that are published in the journal that you have chosen because that indicates that your paper will be, uh, will fit with that journal. When you're writing a title, we generally use the title format, which is a capital letter for each of the main words. We try and make a straight, a strong statement. Now we want to get hit by Google. So we try and use as many keywords as possible. The more keywords you can squeeze into the title and into the abstract, the better. 
you should always begin your title with one of the keywords, if at all possible. So here you've got an example, breastfeeding and health promotion. And then we've got a colon. The reason for the colon is because it's a way of linking two sentences. So here we've got two different ideas because normally we can only put one idea into a, a title. But here we've got two ideas. We've got breastfeeding and health promotion. And then we've got the experience of Aboriginal mothers. Now, what I should have added was two more words in Western Australia or in Outback Australia or something like that, because that would also give us the location. Now, obviously, breastfeeding, health promotion, Aboriginal and mothers uh, is, are all keywords. So that particular title will get a lot of uh, hits from Google or the other databases if people are searching for articles on breastfeeding or if we put Australia in there on Australia. Occasionally we use a question for a title, but that's not uh, very particularly common. So to summarize what I've been saying, start with the most important keyword, include as many keywords as possible. Don't forget to mention the subject, the type of study and the location. The authors, well, it varies from journal to journal. That's a typical way of stating what you've, your name and your qualifications. We have quite a number of arguments about authors. Uh, as a head of school, I always insisted that people decide who is going to be an author at the beginning of any particular project. In my school, we always put the PhD student who is doing the work and who was looking forward to their career uh, as the first author of at least one or two papers from a particular project. The abstract. Generally, it's about 200 words. Some, some journals like 150, some allow you to more. You should always write the article after the abstract after the article is completed. You must use a standard abstract. In other words, it must follow the following headings. Some journals like the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health don't actually type those uh, headings into the abstract. We just have one or two paragraphs. Other journals do, but whether or not they include the headings, you've still got to follow that outline. The objective or the issue that you're going to address, a statement on the methods and the results and the conclusion. You've always got to give some results to uh, attract the, a reader, but you can't just give a whole <clears throat> list of, of, of results and nothing else, and you certainly can't put a table in there. And as I said, as many keywords as you possibly can. Popular keywords, well, at the moment, randomized controlled trial is a very popular uh, word, so you should put that in. And I suppose COVID or COVID-19 would also be a popular one uh, for 2020. Main body of the text is always the same, an introduction, the methods, the results, a discussion and the conclusion, and then the acknowledgements and the references. The introduction, it's the most difficult part of your paper to write, because if the editor or the reader doesn't like the first few sentences that they're going to read, then they'll simply reject your paper. So the first sentence is the key to impressing the, the editor. It's really important. The first part of the introduction, about 200 words or so, you should uh, outline some of the history of the, of the uh, topic, why it's important. What are the gaps in our knowledge? Uh, and then go on to 
uh, a more detailed review of what's going on. Don't forget that science builds on previous science. And so normally we start off with one or two uh, historical papers. When you're writing a review, no matter how short it is, it's always got to be a critical review. By a critical review, we mean that you don't accept what is written in or published in any paper. You assess its strengths and its weaknesses. You must quote something about the method, the case control study, qualitative study, a cross-sectional survey, a randomized control trial, the, start, the sample represented the total population of Sri Lanka uh, or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, generally we cite one or two statistics such as an odds ratio or a risk ratio and so on. And you can do all of that in one sentence. We've got to include one or two references to the methods that we're going to use. You can either put this in an introduction or more commonly in recent years, it's been placed in the methods section. We don't, we don't really have a preference for in our journal. It's important that you include definitions. And again, they can be either here or they can be in the methods section, whichever you prefer. For example, if you're writing about breastfeeding, which I uh, have probably published about 200 papers in the area, it's important to define exactly what you are talking about. You always quote a source. You use a standard definition, like, such as WHO or a learned institution. If you invent your own definition, it will be at your peril. Don't use abbreviations. They really, really annoy editors. I only allow my PhD students to use two abbreviations. One is BMI, because everybody knows what that is. And the other is kilogram for kg for kilogram. Be very careful about abbreviations. If an editor is working hard and they're getting towards the end of the night, it's about midnight and they've still got a few papers to read and they come across a strange abbreviation, they're just as likely to throw your paper in the rubbish bin. Conclude the introduction with an aim, objective or a research question, whichever you prefer. Now, this is the last sentence of the introduction. It's one sentence, it's 10 to 12 words, <clears throat> and it tells the reader exactly what they are going to find in this paper. Occasionally you might want to put two objectives there, but be careful. It's better to have one good objective and have your paper address one topic and only one topic. And of course, if you publish, uh, if you've done a project and you've got three or four objectives, that means that you can get three or four papers, of course, if they're worth publishing. Methods, describe uh, what you're going to do, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the method that you're going to use, is it the best? And the last point is very, very important. How will you monitor quality? Even something like weighing babies or weighing adults or measuring height. Will somebody be checking that? Will you be standardizing the scales every day? If it's in a laboratory, how many times will you be running uh, standardization checks and so on? Sometimes you can't use the latest method. For example, if you're looking at body composition, the best method is to use doubly labeled water with isotopes, non-radioactive isotope, but they're still isotopes. And that can be expensive. You can spend hundreds of dollars on one measurement. So that to get a, a sample of a thousand uh, subjects, you might be up for a million dollars worth of uh, equipment and uh, disposables. That's obviously impossible for most people. So you have to say, okay, we acknowledge that that's the best method, but this is uh, this one is almost as good and off you go 
If you're using questionnaires, make sure that they are standard questionnaires. Editors stripe their hands in horror when they get a paper which says, we devised a questionnaire and these are the answers without validating it, without telling us whether it's culturally relevant and so on. So if at all possible, use a standard <coughs> questionnaire. And in fact, the development of a, of a good standardized questionnaire is probably a PhD in itself. Sample, I can't go into how you choose a sample, but make sure that it's uh, representative of some population. Generally, uh, we <clears throat> most good papers uh, have some kind of random sampling. Ethics. You will not get your paper published in our journal if you do not have ethics approval, unless, of course, it's a paper which is a review or which uses uh, some kind of lab experiment based on perhaps cell cultures or something like that. If you involve people at all, you must have an ethics committee approval. This, you must quote the uh, number from the ethics committee and it must be given before you start to collect data. And these are some of the factors that we look for in ethics approval. Some journals we don't require it yet, but we probably will in the future now require evidence that all of the databases that you use are being lodged in a permanent data repository. That means that they are open for others to analyze at some stage in the future in case there is any question about the validity of your data or if they want to include it in a single case meta-analysis. If you're writing a literature review, you still need a method section, but you won't need ethics. And you've got to describe the search strategy in detail, such as the keywords, the years, the language, the database, <clears throat> and you need to follow the PRISMA guidelines. The results are the heart of a paper, about a thousand words. You've got to provide enough information to allow others to reach the same conclusions as you have and to understand if bias and errors have been accounted for. Make sure your research question has been answered. Don't answer a different research question. You'd be surprised at the number of papers we've received over the years where they've started off doing some kind of research but found out something else and so they simply put that in the results section uh, without bothering to go back and rewrite the objective. Whenever you use a sample, you've got to put in respond rate, response rates and if possible, details of those who agreed to participate and those who didn't. And we usually include the first table, uh, some of those details. Descriptive uh, statistics, don't forget that basic descriptive statistics are required, but nowadays almost always you'll require multivariate analysis. <clears throat> Here's an interesting article I received not so long ago. This was about waiting time at a clinic, and you can see the mean waiting time for consultancy was 11.84 minutes, plus or minus 8.932. Now, of course, this is just nonsense. Nobody is going to measure time to one hundredth of a minute when you're waiting to see a doctor. So don't put stupid things in. Remember the basics of your statistics. This is a, a flow chart for a, a standard sort of project. We often publish, publish these. At least you should prepare one so that you've got it available if we require it. Um, we don't have time to go through all the charts, but I think they're in your <coughs> in your uh, workbook. Don't forget to include one or two uh, tables and perhaps a graph. If you're putting in a graph, make sure that the title is self-explanatory, what I call the scissors test test. You print out your table, you cut it out with a pair of scissors, you give it to your colleagues and say, what does this mean? 
So it must have a title. The labels must be clear and correct. And usually we start the axis, axis at zero. And if you're using log scales or something unusual, make sure that you state that. Uh, when you're doing graphs, make sure that you put error bars so that we know um, the variability in your graph. But at the bottom, make sure you explain what the error bars are. Do they represent a range? Do they represent a standard deviation? Or preferably, they should represent 95% uh, confidence intervals around the mean. The discussion, very difficult part to write uh, after the abstract, because you've got to think. You've got to tell us what you found out, how your results differ from previous studies and in what ways. Why are your results different if they are? Was it a different sample? Was it a different method of measurement? Did you uh, measure in a different country? which has different environment and so on. And then how does your study add to our knowledge? What difference is this going to make to public health in the Asia Pacific region? And that's the most important question that you should answer. And the thing that as an editor, we look for all the time. And then you go on to say what further research is now needed. Um, and sometimes you want to write uh, a couple of interesting stories. For example, in the next issue of the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health, we have an analysis of the coronavirus epidemic in one of the Asian countries. And in that, there are three or four little paragraphs describing the impact of the virus on individual workers and their families, how they are virtually starving because the husband has lost his work as a uh, rickshaw puller. Um, they almost brought tears to my eyes, but it's, it's, it's really good if you can bring back the human side of public health. Now that doesn't apply to most of the studies, but occasionally it does. Always you must put in a limitations paragraph. If you don't have a limitations paragraph and we like your paper, we'll ask you to write one, but it's always best to put it in first. There are always some limitations. All studies have limitations with regard to sample size, sample selection, and so on, um, or the method that you used, or the, the results. You found a significant difference, but clinically, uh, a difference in a growth rate of a couple of hundred grams is neither here nor there. Don't give such a depressingly long list that you make the editor think that your paper is not worth publishing. A paragraph with three or four limitations is what we need. And then you finalize your paper with a conclusion, the last paragraph, where you provide a quick summary of the most important findings. In the abstract at the beginning and the conclusion at the end, you don't put in any statistics or any information that is not included in your statistics uh, in the actual article. Now, you'd be surprised at how often people discover something new right at the end. And so rather than go back and rewrite all their article, they just pop it into the abstract or they pop it into the conclusion. Don't do that. The editor will find it and he will reject your paper. And almost always at the end of the discussion or in the conclusion, we say, okay, this is a very good study. Uh, it means public health practice. It may not because it's the first study in the area. And we generally recommend um, more research. Nowadays, when you are preparing your references, you should always use EndNote. Without EndNote to ensure absolute accuracy, you will have a great deal of difficulty uh, putting in correct references. If we find references that we don't like, um, if there's a couple of incorrect formats, we might accept your paper and tell you to go back and correct it. 
But if they're all wrong, then we'll just simply reject your paper. But EndNote is the way to go. If you don't have EndNote, then there are a number of other uh, free databases available, but they are not as easy to use as EndNote is. Don't forget to include a number of references to your own work and from your own group. This will increase the citation rate for you personally, uh, increase your H index, and it will also uh, make your head of school, your dean, very happy as their group gets a, a higher rating. So it's essential that you include references from the most recent year or years. This shows that your work is current and that you've kept up to date. For example, we sometimes get articles submitted where all of the references finish at 2017. This means that probably the person finished writing their thesis in 2017, or they submitted to another journal in 2017 or 2018, and it's been continuously rejected, and so now it's come to us. You're wasting your time, because one of the first things I do is to check and make sure that the references are up to date. Number of references, usually 20 or 30, unless you're writing a review, in which case we'll accept up to about 50, or you're submitting to a journal like Social Science and Medicine, or one of the newer open access journals where you can submit as many references as you like. And this is generally the kind of distribution that you would have. Um, a couple for the introduction and the setting, then in the literature review of what's gone on before, generally around about 10 references, and then in your discussion, another 10 or so. So that's, that's a, a sort of a general outline of what you should be doing. Author's contributions. It's really important that you get this right. All the journals now require you to describe what everybody has done. And you must follow the, I haven't put it here, it's in the, it's in the, oops. Okay, author's contributions. Make sure that everybody has actually made a contribution. I've just got a couple more to go. I'll spend five more minutes uh, and then we'll open up to any questions. Make sure that your paper is relevant to the journal, that you address public health in the Asia Pacific region. And remember the APAC vision to achieve the highest possible level of health for all of the people of the nations of the Asia Pacific region. That's what APAC does. That's what the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health aims to assist. That's gotta be relevant to the journal. The key themes of public health are that it's population-based, that it's prevention, and that we are promoting health for all, equity. Uh, English. Probably the most common reason that papers are rejected is because the English is so bad. Uh, try, try, try to get your English correct. Get a native English speaker to help you, uh, help you write it. We can do a little bit of help, but not very much. We don't have funds to do that. Make sure that you've got simple things like don't send me a paper with the title with a spelling mistake. Get male and female and tense and plural and singular correct and so on. How do you improve your English? You write, 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 write a lot and you read, 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 read. And if you want a good free course, then the BBC is probably the best that's available that's free. Keep your papers below the 3000 words, otherwise we'll throw it out. Ethics, we've talked about ethics and study design. Make sure that you follow a recognised epidemiological base. Some of the things that we are very nervous about is the lack of blindness, use of historical controls, 
and questionnaires which aren't standardised. All randomised controlled trials must now be registered before you start. Um, if you would like to write a review for our journal, please send me a note first and he or she will advise you whether it's a suitable topic. For example, if you are going to uh, write a review on the outcomes of, uh, I don't know, some sort of a surgical procedure, then obviously that's not relevant to our journal. We want things that are relevant to public health. And don't be discouraged. If your paper is rejected, learn from the reviewers. The APJPH is a high level journal so that you can expect to be rejected occasionally. A lot of my papers still get rejected, but we modify them, improve them, and generally they ultimately get uh, published. One of the best bits of advice I can give you is to present your paper at an APAC conference as a poster or as a short presentation. You'll get useful feedback and in normal, normal conferences post COVID, the editor will be there and you can discuss uh, any problems with them. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I hope that we can answer some of your questions and even more, I hope that you will submit your papers to your own journal. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Colin. That, that was very wonderful. I've uh, learned a lot from the uh, your views. I've got plenty of questions here. <laughs> it looks like a lot of people are asking questions, so I'll, I'll start with some of the questions. Um, the first question that I have here from the audience, uh, from Emma, she says, I'm interested in the limit to the number of references. Now, they've completed a review of 72 studies using visual methods to examine eating behavior. Now, what with that limit uh, of number of reference, does this limit the journals that they can send to their paper? Uh, <coughs> it depends. If you're going to send it to our journal, then, then uh, we, don't, we have a limited number of pages because we print our journal. Journals that are online, such if it's, if it's eating disorders, a journal like uh, Nutrients or IJRPH or something like that, they don't have any restrictions because they are only online. You don't get a printed copy. Uh, so you can either write to me and tell me what you've done or you can submit to one of those other journals. Great. Um... Here's another one. Uh, I think you also mentioned about COVID just now. So there's a question from uh, a little bit about COVID. Now, this, in this pandemic situation, there seems to be a large number of manuscripts that are publishing as preprint. So uh, this candidate would like to submit a, their journal, a, their paper to Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health. Now, the question is, there, I think there's a few questions here. Uh, one, does, would, do I cite these preprint papers? And will APEC reviewers reject my paper if I do so? I think the issue is around um, what is the importance of preprint and can we consider a preprint as a publication? So there's, there's plenty of questions. If you have a preprint, yeah. Okay, if you have a preprint, your paper will be rejected by the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health. We consider that prior publication. We have a really high demand for the space in our journal. And if you've chosen to uh, print it somewhere else, well, that's, that's your choice. But what in terms of the number of articles, some uh, a recent estimate was that there's been some 65,000 papers published on COVID. We've had, uh, I don't know, probably 600, 700, maybe 800 papers submitted on COVID, most of which are pretty much the same. They're quoting statistics or articles from newspapers. Uh, so we can only publish a very limited number of them. And most of the ones we are publishing uh, will be as short communications or letters to the editor. Uh, what about uh, papers which was not preprint, but uh, a, a, an original paper, should one consider 
citing a preprint paper? Would the reviewers reject uh, papers that cite preprint papers? Yeah, they'll be rejected because they haven't been reviewed. We only allow people to cite uh, reviewed papers in established journals. Now, COVID's just a little bit different. We'll allow a little latitude with COVID because it's such a rapidly developing uh, epidemic. But generally, you can only cite uh, government reports, statistics from organisations like the WHO or papers from uh, reputable referee journals. We may let you have one reference to a newspaper just to set uh, the tone. Personal, personal communications, those kinds of things are not permitted in our journal. So references are also very important for the uh, publish. I mean, for the writers or the researchers to really look into and not just reference any, 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 any journals, right? Sure. Um, yeah. Here's another one uh, from Sonali. Uh, she's asking, how long does it usually take to provide the decision uh, of acceptance or rejection of uh, papers submitted to APEC? <laughs> Too long. The problem is that we are all volunteers. Um, I spend two or three days a week full time working on the journal. Uh, a lot of our reviewers, that's because I'm I'm retired and I can I can do that much and fit in with the rest of the work that I'm doing. But a lot of our reviewers have got very busy jobs and find it hard to read and turn around the papers quickly. We do the best that we can. Uh, my aim would be three months, but we're not reaching that sometimes. Um, I don't know whether Wayun or Bairav can can give us a more up-to-date figure. Yeah, I think uh, Bairav is also typing out the answers. Uh, this, there's the answers for those who are asking about the number of references. She's already put it up on chat. So for those who are listening, you can also look at the chat for some of the answers. I still have a few questions for you, Prof. Colin Vince. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is about, uh, you mentioned the types of papers just now that is being published in APEC. So what is the value of submitting a paper under short communication? Well, short communication doesn't necessarily get reviewed. I read them all and make an assessment. Uh, we try and publish them more rapidly. Uh, we're not quite so rigorous about uh, standards of uh, the study and so on. So it's an easier way to start. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a PhD student not long ago who, who said, my aim is to publish an article in The Lancet. And I said, hang on, you know, you're a PhD student, you're not going to get an article in The Lancet. Anyway, every week when The Lancet came out, he would read The Lancet and he would write a letter to the editor. And sometimes they were relevant and occasionally he would hit. And in the course of his PhD, he published three or four letters to the editor, maybe 50 words, maybe 100 words, commenting on studies from his own country. And in the end, it looked quite impressive because his CV as a PhD student, he had three or four letters to the editor. So even a letter to the editor, although it's not a refereed article, it might help you get a scholarship, a fellowship or a job. Hi, thanks. Oh, that, that's a wonderful story. <laughs> Something for, for the PhD students who are listening in. So it if got you him really... a job anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Right, here's another one. Here's from uh, Zahwa Junaid. Uh, her question is, if the research submitted to APEC is rejected once due to some mistakes and the authors have corrected it, can this be submitted again after corrections? If we, if we uh, send your article back and say you can resubmit it, then yes, but generally... As I said before, there's such a demand to get our papers published that you only get one chance. So make it a good submission in the first place. Um, there are 
few more, two more, I think two more, two more questions. Yes, coming up. Um, this is about uh, writing or plagiarism, um, and which is one of the most common publication misconduct. So this person is asking, how how does she prevent plagiarism, or or paraphrasing? Does paraphrasing considered as one of uh, components of plagiarism? Whenever you. We, we encourage people to read other people's articles and to build on their research. But if you are quoting other people's ideas, then you must cite that paper. You must give the reference. If you are putting in a direct quote, which can only be one or two sentences at the most, then you must put it in inverted commas and so that it's clear that it is a quote. We detect plagiarism first of all the our reviewers and the editor read a lot of other papers and we will check to make sure that your that your uh, article has not been published anywhere else we will check the authors and we will check the topic and we also have access to plagiarism software when we detect plagiarism we write to the author and they are banned from the journal uh we write to their the head of their university and say please discipline this person if the head of the university says oh that's okay we don't mind then we ban that university from our journal would you believe we've had several cases where articles have been previously published in a in a different journal and we even had one where it had previously been published twice. And so this was the third attempt to get the same article published with just a few words changed. We detected it and it was rejected. And that person and that university have been banned. Oh, wow. So for those who are listening in, um, I think this is something that the uh, authors would need to really look into. Um, so when you quote someone, you acknowledge the person that you're quoting. Uh, here's another one from Raja Ratnam. Is there a possibility to write a paper which is about three to four years old, I suppose, as a research project? Oh, it's quite common for us to publish uh, papers on data sets that are three or four years old because it often takes that long to finish a project, to do the complete analysis and to write it up. So that would be fine. We often reject we often receive papers that are written on the basis of data which is 10 to 15 years old and unless there is a very good reason they are rejected because as i said we have plenty of papers submitted with more recent data that are likely to be more relevant so yeah the moral of the story is publish your paper quickly as soon as you can and that comes down to planning a project. If you've got a good project that you are going to do, uh, one of the first things that you do when you're planning the project is to uh, put down a list of the papers that you hope to publish. You even put down the target journals that you're thinking about. And next to that, you write the name of the person who's responsible for that paper. Now, I make sure that anybody in my school does that. If that person whose name is there doesn't publish the paper within, say, six months of the data becoming available, then they are removed and somebody else takes over. And they still remain an author, but it's further down the list. So planning is the key to success. Important tip. So we're looking forward for Raja uh paper uh, today. Back. Last question for Colin. Uh, this is regarding informed consent. You mentioned something about consent for uh, those who are submitting to APEC. Uh, comparing between verbal and written consent, especially in middle-income country or developing countries, does APEC allow verbal consent uh, be taken in as papers? What are your views? Look, we have to be a little bit flexible in this one. Most... Most of the major journals, for example, if you're submitting to the New England Journal or the Lancet, they will require you to have uh, informed consent. For example, I was reading a study last night on a COVID vaccine 
and the informed consent consisted of 23 pages of closely typed uh, issues of uh, issue, uh, information about the study and the person had to sign that before they were allowed to participate. And of course, the, the, that, that's getting ridiculous because nobody is going to read 23 pages of type consent. They so have to be sensible. We, we recognise that there are some situations in our region where verbal consent is, is the only way possible. But we also insist on proper consent. For example, if you come to me and you've got a survey of children in a high school and you've got 500 kids and 100% of them participated, we will reject that paper on the basis that it's impossible that 500 kids all were informed and agreed to participate without any questions. So, yeah, we look at, we look at all situations. Thank you, Prof. Colin Prince. That's a really important messages and question and answers that we've, we've learned a lot from you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think moving on, we've got our second presenter. Uh, our second presenter is uh, Professor Lo Yun from uh, University of Malaya Kuala Lumpur. She is currently the president of APEC and the managing director of Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health. And she will be talking about how to write a qualitative research paper. Prof Lau, over right. to you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof Noron. Okay, can you all see my slides? Yeah. Okay, now let us now move on. Now, um, let's just switch gear. I think what Professor Colin Baines uh, have earlier uh, presented, uh, it's uh, basically based on quantitative research paper, all right, where you have loads and loads of data and statistics uh, are involved. Whereas in a qualitative research, we have very minimal statistics uh, involved, all right? Uh, I reckon that the only table or statistics that I will see in any qualitative research paper is just the social demographic data of your participants. Other than that, you won't see any, you know, sophisticated uh, statistical analysis. And so I will quickly walk through with you for this half an hour on how to actually write a qualitative research uh, paper. And so these are some of the challenges of uh, a qualitative uh, research, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, paper. Now, uh, qualitative research is very, very different from uh, quantitative uh, uh, writing uh, in, in a sense that it is a style you know, of uh, uh, writing. But nevertheless, I think uh, in all the various sessions uh, like introduction, uh, literature review, methods, um, you, you know, they're, they're all the same. And uh, now, if you were to submit a qualitative research paper uh, to any journal, I think most reviewers are very familiar with quantitative writing. Uh, similarly, so it's the same as uh, our journal, the Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health, where I think most of our reviewers are very familiar with quantitative. So when we do get a qualitative uh, research paper, we do need to look out you know, for reviewers uh, who do, you know, um, have expertise uh, in qualitative uh, research. Now, in qualitative research as well, uh, it's the huge amount of data that you have actually collected. And it's all about the depth and the rich, uh, richness of the data that you have collected uh, through your interviews, through your focus group discussion, and through, you know, all your tape recording. And uh, even one interview or one focus group discussion gives you, you know, a huge amount of data. And then you have to sit down and analyze it and then think about how you are going to analyze the data to answer all your research question. Now, uh, in qualitative uh, writing, uh, findings cannot be captured in statistics. I think I've said that uh, just now. And uh, in terms of writing, you need to make your story, your paper very convincing and, uh, and, and, and strong enough you know, for the reviewer to fully understand what you're trying to say. And it's because of a huge amount of data that is involved, you do need to, 
to order your data in such a way you know that there is a flow from one session to another session uh, there is a flow in terms of how you actually answer your research question or your research uh, objective now these are characteristics of a qualitative research writing uh, now, in qualitative research writing, there is no uh, clean cutoff between data collection, analysis, and writing, unlike quantitative uh, uh, research writing. Um, here, you know, the minute you start collecting your data, you start your analysis, and you may even want to jot down, you know, all the points that you experience during the data collection uh, via your interview or your focus group uh, discussion. So when it comes to analysis and writing, it's a continuous process, it's mountainous and multifaceted. And there is really no time when everything else stops and writing starts. So basically your writing starts, you know, the minute you start collecting your data. And you do need to sort it out through, you know, select and weave through a great amount of the, uh, you know, humongous data that you have actually uh, collected. And here again, you know, sometimes students are really lost as to how, you know, they should, you know, sift through all the data. And also when it comes to writing a qualitative research uh, a paper, uh, there is a lack of consensus. There's really no standard format, unlike the quantitative research uh, writing. As one has been uh, mentioned by Professor Collins earlier, you, feel, you know, you follow through the, the IMRAT method the introduction, the methods, the results, discussion, and conclusion. Now, here again, I think it's important for you to refer to the journal that you are submitting your article to. Uh, they may have different, you know, style in terms of uh, uh, the various sessions that you should be writing for a qualitative uh, research paper. So it's important for you to always refer to uh, the journal that you are submitting your article uh, to. Now, questions a paper must answer. Uh, very important, this is what the reviewer or the editor will say, you know, why should anyone be interested in your study? Why, why, why should we be interested in, in a paper that you're submitting to us? And we look at, you know, your methodology, very important, your research design, whether it's credible, achievable, and, you know, you need to carefully explain how you execute, you know, uh, the data collection. And, uh, you know, your capability as well, your track record, as to, you know, in terms of doing qualitative uh, research. So basically, these are the various sessions of a qualitative uh, research paper. Uh, you do have this uh, background uh, information, your introduction, the significance of your study, why is it so important, uh, you know, your research uh, purpose, your research question, and your objective. And then, you know, just give us a mini literature of uh, the topic that you're embarking on, and then moving on to your research methods and your design. You know, uh, what kind of research uh, design, you know, have you chosen and why? Is it phenomenology? Is it case study? Uh, is it grounded theory and what have you? So you do give us, uh, you do need to give a, a rationale justification as you why, as to why you chose a certain design. And also here under this session as well, research design and methods, uh, the type of sampling that you have chosen, is it purposive, um, is it quota sampling, and what have you. So your data metering get, uh, methods and your data analysis. Again, here we have the uh, trustworthiness of your uh, um, methods that you're using, basically what we call validity in quantitative uh, method. And of course, your ethical issues as well. Uh, similarly, like in any other research, in quantitative research as well, you do need to pay attention to ethical issues. Uh, findings and uh, discussion, here again, the session of findings and discussion. Uh, in, in our journal, uh, we would like you know, to have a session on findings, your results, followed by another session on discussion. But in some journal, you know, when you are presenting particular to a qualitative uh, a research uh, a journal, uh, they do combine the results session, the findings together with the discussion. So always, always refer to the journal that you are submitting your article to. And finally, your conclusion, your recommendation, your recommendation has to be something that is out from your findings, yeah, from your results. And based on the results that you have found, you therefore recommend you know, uh, uh, other procedures or, or intervention. 
and also finally the implications of your study and your references or appendix. So basically, uh, these are the sessions of a qualitative uh, uh, research paper. Now, let me now move on to each and every one of it. Uh, introduction, what is this paper all about and why you have chosen this topic? Basically the rationale and the importance or the significance of your uh, research. And also your uh, research question, all this has to be uh, inside the, here. Uh, the, the problem can be very broad, but you must be specific enough to convince others as we're focusing on. And, uh, and the scope of your research questions uh, need to be manageable within the time frame. Uh, of course, we are now talking about journal publication. Yeah, uh, and so here, if you are talking about the actual research itself, you do need to think of the time frame when you're supposed to finish and when you're supposed to uh, uh, publish uh, your, your findings. Now, uh, literature review, it's very important here. Uh, you must always come up with the uh, latest, uh, what is latest out there, you know, as far as the topic uh, you are researching into. Yeah, uh, you do need to have a proper understanding uh, in the context, you know, of what uh, you are doing to justify, you know, why you're doing a certain topics. So you basically read your literature review to come up with gaps and how you're actually going to address those gaps that you found, you know, in all the literature that you have uh, read. And sometimes by reading literature review as well, it gives you a hint of what you'll be doing, you know, for your own study as far as research design is concerned. And also it gives you a hint of the kind of methodology people are using. So this will actually guide you in your own uh, 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 write-up. So the contents of literature review, uh, what we already know about a topic, this is important, and what you have to say critically about what is already known. So when you are reading any literature review, a critical analysis of what you are reading, it's very important. And has anyone done anything exactly the same as what you're going to do? And where does your work actually fits in? Uh, yeah, so you have to put your work in a context, you know, of the subject matter that you are researching in. And is your research worth doing in the light of what has already been done? So you have to build up your case, yeah, when you're doing your uh, research. Uh, in terms of qualitative methodology, uh, how do you go about your research and how do you identify whom you're going to interview in the sense that in terms of recruitment, uh, if you are interviewing, let's say, the various stakeholders, you need to tell us how you actually, you know, got all these uh, stakeholders that you're interviewing. And when you actually conduct the field work and how extensive, you know, was your, your involvement. Here, what is your role? It's basically your, you know, your own reflexivity. Uh, you do need to tell us, you know, what is your role in that particular uh, study that you're doing. Uh, description of the particular method that will be used and its rationale. Here again, you know, what are the qualitative uh, uh, research methods that you're, that you're using? Uh, is it uh, ethnography? Is it life history or phenomenology or case study, grounded theory or, uh, uh, you know, uh, participatory action research? So uh, whatever methods you use, you need to clearly justify as to, you know, um, why you are doing it. Uh, if you do have a theoretical framework, uh, you have to present it and uh, gain, you know, analysis of data. We need to know how you actually analyzed uh, your, your data. And as far as sampling is concerned, you know, what kind of sampling you're using? Is it purposive sampling? Yeah, is it quota sampling or what have you? Now, very important, this is very different from quantitative uh, research. In qualitative, you know, your sampling is not to generalize to the whole population, very important. You generalize it to the theory that you have, yeah? Uh, whereas in quantitative, you know, generalization, uh, uh, it's very important. Uh, characteristics of the participants, uh, you do need to know this uh, social demographic information. Uh, for instance, uh, do you have any inclusion exclusion criteria of the uh, participants uh, who will be involved in your study? and how uh, decisions are made as far as the sampling is concerned. Uh, your sample size here, um, it's not so much calculation as what Professor Colin has mentioned in his paper on quantitative uh, research paper, where you know, uh, in his quanti in, in quantitative research paper, you do need to calculate your sample size, very important. Yeah? And there are softwares available that you can actually calculate your sample size. 
in qualitative research uh, per se, uh, here you don't calculate your sample size. It is very much based on previous experience, your pilot study, and for as long as you reach a saturation point and you stop collecting your data, very important. And how do you actually gain access uh, to the participants? That is, you know, recruitment of participants, yeah? And of course, you know, some of them uh, where, you know, they refuse to participate in your study, you invite them to be interviewed and they refuse to be interviewed. Uh, I believe there are some reasons why, you know, they actually refuse to uh, participate in your study. Now, data collection and analysis, uh, what kind of data collection technique are you using? Is it in that interview, one-to-one -one interview? face-to-face -face interview, is it participant observation, is it live history, is it focus group discussion, what we call FGD, or personal or public uh, documents, you are referring to documents, memos, uh, you're looking at photographs, videos, analyzing videos, and, and so forth and so on. And also the kind of analysis uh, that you use, you need to tell us what kind of analysis you are using, is it constant comparison, is it content analysis, thematic analysis, discourse analysis. So you do need to tell us what kind of analysis you're actually uh, 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 utilizing in your research. And of course, you need to fully describe how your data uh, you know, uh, uh, is gathered and uh, processed. Now, when it comes to data management analysis, how are your data kept, organized, and retrieved? There are many qualitative analysis software. You have Atlas, NVivo, you know, all, all sorts. So uh, if you are using any software, then you have to, uh, you know, uh, think which software you'll be uh, using for your analysis because you have huge amount of data. And those were the days you don't have any of these computer software, uh, you know, anthropologists or sociologists, they actually do it manually when it comes to coding. But right now, you know, with all this computer software, it actually relieves, you know, the, the, the burden of uh, coding. And how do you engage in reflexivity? Very important, uh, self-analytical. But you must always put yourself, you know, uh, um, uh, in, um, in the context itself as to what is your role here in this whole uh, uh, research. Uh, just quoting an example, um, I had supervised uh, a PhD uh, student of mine, he's actually a breast cancer surgeon, and uh, here, here with us, uh, a, a kind of renowned uh, breast cancer surgeon. So uh, he's kind of puzzled as to why women here in Malaysia uh, kind of, you know, they do come in very late for their breast cancer surgery. So they only come into the clinic where they are stage three or stage four. So as a surgeon herself and as a woman herself, so he's wondering why are all these women coming late? And so basically that's the whole title of a whole PhD. Yeah. So she has to put herself, he has to reflect as to as a surgeon, you know, she just, just couldn't sit back and see and, and, and he tried to understand why all these women are actually coming late. And so that, you know, through her study, you know, she could at, at least, uh, you know, help all these women to come in uh, much earlier. And also she see herself as a woman. Yeah, you know, uh, these are breast cancer uh, survivors. Uh, some of them may not have survived. And also how does women actually see uh, uh, breast cancer uh, uh, themselves? And so you also need to convince the reader why you interpret the data uh, uh, the way you did. So again, here in terms of writing up your data analysis, uh, it's uh, the way you actually interpret your data, it's very important, all right? Uh, so these are some of the qualitative uh, software analysis packages. Uh, in, in, in quantitative study, you are doing a survey or whatnot. Uh, you have the R, you have the SPSS, you have the starter, uh, you know, and what have you, and what have you. Now in qualitative research analysis, you have, you know, the Atlas, you have Nudis, you have Endography, uh, you have the NVivo and, and others. Some of these are free and some of these uh, you do need to buy as they are all licensed copy. Yeah, and so some of my students have used some of the free ones. And if not, you know, um, actually our universities, uh, we do have a license for uh, NVivo. So for our students or academics who are doing qualitative research, they can actually download this as the university has actually paid a license yeah, for the uh, students and academics uh, alike. Now, when it comes to trustworthiness or what you call validity in quantitative study, 
you need to reflect throughout your paper uh, using relevant criteria for qualitative approach use. Very important. Constant reflection is very important when you're talking about qualitative uh, 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 research because you constantly have to put yourself, in, you know, uh, you have to immerse yourself in the data, all right? And that's why it's very different from quantitative. When you're doing data collection, you yourself, your researcher is the tool. You are the main tool because you're the researcher. Whereas in quantitative survey, you can always hire someone to collect the data for you. Yeah, uh, you have the research grant. We normally hire enumerators, uh, you know, to go out uh, to the field and collect data. Whereas in qualitative research, when it comes to interviewing people, when it comes to conducting focus group discussion, you yourself, the researcher, is the main tool. Yeah, so it's very important for you to actually immerse yourself into the data to fully understand, you know, how the data, you know, came about. And the uh, example of strategies that we use is triangulation, very important. So, you know, uh, you may wonder, you know, uh, the truth coming up from someone's, uh, uh, coming up from a horse mouth. And sometimes you want to triangulate with a memo, sometimes you want to triangulate, let's say with uh, hospital records or school records, for instance, students' examination marks, yeah so again triangulation is very important yeah so that means to say that you want to verify a certain uh, code you know a certain argument you know from a different angle uh, prolonged contact with the informants is very important and a member chat you know uh, if you're let's say you know studying something on uh, about a student then the member chat could be uh, you can ask questions you know uh, you know uh, of the of the parents or even the school teacher or even you know the peers yeah the friends so it's a continuous validation of the data, very important. And also checking of representativeness of the data and feed between coding categories and, 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 and the data. Now, very important is representative of the data. Sometimes you may wonder you have so many codes. Yeah, everybody is saying, you know, all, all, all different stories. So which one does it represent? That's very important. So you as a researcher, there are so many codes, you need to pick out, you know, those codes that represent uh, the participants in your study that represents the overall data. And of course, you know, you can also use experts consultant, yeah, uh, to verify, you know, certain information that is uh, uh, divulged. Uh, strategies for limiting bias in interpretation, uh, search for negative cases. Negative cases are also cases that you can uh, deliberate on, yeah, and also describe how analysis will be included for purposive examination. And using members of the research team to critically question the analysis. So sometimes when you are doing coding, for instance, or analysis, uh, you don't just do it yourself. If, you, if you're a student, you can always uh, analyze it, uh, come up with the proper codes, categories, together with your supervisors or your mentor. And if you have a research team with other research members, you sit down as pair or, or in three uh, to come up you know, uh, with a consensus on the various codes or categories or teams yeah, uh, that you derived from the, the data. And the audit trail of data collection and analytic uh, strategies. So all these are some of the strategies that you can actually use to decrease all the uh, bias. Now, when it comes to ethical issues as well, uh, it's qualitative research. You are interviewing uh, uh, people, uh, and therefore, you know, the IRB it's important. You do need to apply for uh, research ethics, uh, informed consent from participants. Yeah, uh, uh, informed consent can be both uh, written and verbal consent. Uh, verbal consent, like for instance, in my area, my forte is actually sexual and reproductive health, which is a very sensitive uh, topic. And sometimes, you know, I ask adolescents about premarital sex, about abortion and what have you, which is very, very sensitive to them. And therefore, if I would ask for informed, written informed consent, they might not give me, and therefore they might not participate in my study. So sometimes what I do is ask for verbal consent because those are very, very sensitive issues indeed. And no one is willing to give out, you know, their identity card, you know, uh, uh, numbers or their passport numbers to you. Uh, dealing with sensitive issues, again, what are sensitive issues? And this varies uh, between cultures, between countries. So very important in your own cultural context, you know, what is considered a sensitive issue. Uh, for instance, in Malaysia, I can only speak, um, you know, from the Malaysian point of view, uh, we do have, you know, research sensitivity, very important, and the whole list of sensitive issues can be, uh, you can see, you know, the whole document, 
uh, it's actually in the website of the Department of Prime Ministers. Uh, let's say you're talking anything about racial, anything about religion, or anything about security, you know, national security and what have you, those are considered, you know, uh, sensitive issues. So it's very important, you know, uh, when you are researching into all these sensitive issues, uh, look into your own uh, national criteria of in terms of data security. Uh, confidentiality, protecting the rights of participants and informant. Uh, very important here, you know, how are you going to keep those information confidential? Uh, for instance, uh, just to share with you, uh, I had a consultancy project with uh, WHO Malaysia here. Uh, it's on uh, unwanted pregnancy. Uh, some of the participants have actually gone through abortion. So I put in a proposal for the consultancy work. And one of the things that came back, you know, from the reviewer uh, in this uh, WHO office here based in Malaysia is that, uh, what do I do with the tape recording after I've interviewed them? And so that's something that I've totally overlooked uh, because some these are very sensitive issues, very personal, uh, you know, to the respondents. It's all about their unwanted pregnancy and their abortion. And then, you know, I tape record the, the interview that I have with them. And then the question is, what do I do with the tape recording after I have transcribed, you know, all the information? So again, confidentiality, data protection, data security is very important for you to highlight how you actually handle those data uh, in your uh, study. And at the end of the day, debriefing is important. Uh, you know, if you're doing a qualitative uh, study, you know, you may be conducting lots of, you know, in that interview, face-to-face -face interview, focus group discussion. So you may have analyzed all your uh, uh, data and then come out with certain uh, findings. So it's important for you to call back all the participants and debrief them, you know, about the findings that you have. So when you are doing your debriefing to all these participants, you know, uh, see whether the findings actually rings a bell to them. It's very important. And of course, you invite all of them to be, you know, at your debriefing. But again, not everybody uh, uh, will attend the debriefing uh, session. Now, findings and discussion, moving on, uh, different uh, journals have different matters. So I say again, in terms of reporting your results, Check again, you know, with the journal that you're submitting to. Now, some in some journal, like for our journal, we separate the finding session, your result session, with the discussion session. In other journal, you know, particularly for qualitative research, they actually combine your results and the, the discussion uh, uh, session. And also, you need to make a clear distinction between presentation and interpretation. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, uh, like in results, you just present what your in quantitative, what your results has shown. But when it comes to interpretation in the discussion section, you interpret what, you know, you have presented in the result session, very important, yeah. Uh, present interpretation clearly and supported by evidence. In qualitative uh, study, your evidence are actually minutes or code. They are voices of the participants, yeah. So basically, when you're writing up the piece of research, qualitative research, you are, you know, the middle person, you know, uh, where the voices of the participants are heard in your paper, in your research report. Uh, you also need to talk about data triangulation. Uh, how do you actually triangulate your data? Yeah, is it through multiple sources? Is it through member chat? Or is it through audit trail? Yeah. Uh, discussion sufficiently grounded in theory. If you have a theory that underpins your research, then you have to bring forth your theory uh, during your during your discussion. And again, limitations and strength of your study is important. This is discussion B. You know, not every study is perfect. You do need to have one or two limitations in your study, but you don't need to give all the limitations. If you have so many limitations, you know, how would the reviewer or the editor would want to accept? Uh, your paper, but you do need to discuss your limitations. Now, how do you actually display your data? Very important. Uh, usual format that represents, uh, sometimes you may have metrics to show us how a coding, how a team is being derived. Yeah. So you have your very raw, you know, quotes from the participants. You come up with quotes or categories. And at the end, you know, you can regroup your quotes or categories to come up with a team. So maybe you have a matrix that actually show us, you know, all these notes or all these codes, yeah? And your data entry, you know, whether it's, you know, blocks of text, uh, uh, you give us quotations, phrases, 
you know, or abbreviations, all this, you have to really uh, spell it out. Now, using transcript uh, codes, uh, you do need to select representative codes, very important, uh, because you have, you know, huge amount of quotation from all the, you know, people that you have interviewed. So exactly which codes are you, uh, you know, uh, has to illustrate, uh, yeah, clearly illustrate the point that you're trying to convey in your paper. So the word sort of phases that commonly use or emerge from the interview. Uh, use provocative quotes to highlight insights, not generally health. Sometimes you may have very provocative quotes, and if something that you want to highlight in your paper, then you should choose uh, those quotes. It draws on different people's voices, not just the most articulated, and you reflect on the range of people interviewed. Very important here. Uh, again, I think reflecting on you know the different uh, people's voices. Uh, in, for instance, you may have maximum variation for your sampling. That means uh, people with different ages and, and uh, yeah, different people, uh, participants with different ages. So you may want to show their voices from younger people, uh, middle-aged people or older people. So all these different voices from different categories of uh, participants that you have actually interviewed. Use quotes to show you know, that it's important not only what people say, but how they actually say it. So again, when you're connecting interviews or focus group discussion, it is not just you know what people are telling you. You transcribe all the quotes, but there are emotions. Yeah, you know uh, whether in the process of interviewing, uh, whether they are laughing or they are crying or they have tears in their eyes. Uh, all these things tells you know a, 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 a thousand words, and use verbatim quotes very important. Yeah, uh, you know uh, so all the interviews that you've conducted. And when you cite in your papers or in a report, you know, you use verbatim code. If the participants say R, you have to mention R in your report, uh, R, U, you know, whatever, all those uh, codes, yeah? So it's actually word for word. Uh, the writing style and the voice as well, when reading a qualitative paper, you can detect, you know, the flow or the tone, yeah, that defines the relationship between the writer and the reader. And these voices, uh, you know, have profound consequences uh, that's why, you know, whenever you are doing a qualitative uh, presentation or whatever, you know, use their voices, yeah, because their voices carries lots of emotions and that you can actually use their voices to move uh, 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 the, the audience. Uh, a matter of choice is connected with the choice of voice, you know, passive versus active, yeah, objective or, you know, your own personal view. And the first person is all right to use, but you don't use it in every sentence, in every paragraph, in every page, all right? Uh, so again, you know, what is your own uh, interpretation, yeah, your role and your place, yeah, you yourself in that context, in that study, right. Uh, reflexivity, I think I've talked about this, is interaction of researcher with the research, uh, with the research itself and the participants. So where do you stand in this whole piece of research, yeah, because I think sometimes the participants, when you are going in to ask, you know, uh, during your interview or whatever, uh, they do want to know, you know, uh, where you're coming from, very important. So it implies a self-awareness, critical evaluation, and your self-consciousness of your own role. Uh, recognition of the power relationship between themselves and participants. Very important, it's the same like you are going to school, you interview the students and uh, uh, the teachers, and then it's that a power imbalance. Like you are, you know, going to a hospital, you interview the patients and uh, the doctors, or the doctor asking questions to the patients, would there be a power imbalance that uh, patients would then be so worried, you know, he has to answer everything yes, if not, they're afraid that you might take over, uh, you, you might take away their, their um, uh, treatment or whatsoever. And so you do need to take account, describe, and you know, the unpredictable things in the research. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, we get surprises in a research when we are doing a data collection. And so you need to reflect upon uh, all, all these uh, surprises as well. And so you do need to summarize uh, your overall findings. Yeah, implication of your findings. I'm in the result session here. Yeah? Uh, you, uh, you don't allow for generalization to a population, but the theory, uh, you recommend, you know, uh, uh, whatever future research, yeah, and future uh, direction. So in qualitative research, do you actually follow the traditional format of IMRA? Uh, introduction matters, results, and discussion. So sometimes it varies between the journals to journals, yeah. 
And so in a qualitative research, your style, it's, you know, can be personal and it has to be lively because they are voices, your quoting quotation and voices of the participants and they are real to the participants here. Yeah? The voices are real to them because it's their voices, it's their story. So you are the middle person, you know, trying to sell uh, their story. Uh, so you need to set a scene to capture the reader's attention and uh, it's going on in the scene and why they behave uh, in a particular way. And so really qualitative papers is not always uh, uh, well structured. Uh, last but not the least, very important, you write the abstract last when you have finished the whole uh, paper. Uh, in your abstract, very important, what's your uh, objective? Uh, what is the problem? Uh, uh, what is uh, your, your research subject important? Uh, what is your data you know, technique? Who are your sample? How do you analyze it? Your main findings you conclude and you know, last sentence, implication of your findings. All right. Now, just to show you some of the papers that we published in ABJBH, this is our qualitative paper. For instance, in 2010, we published this domestic, uh, domestic Violence Against Women qualitative study. So these are some of all the qualitative studies that uh, we have published uh, uh, in our journal. All right. Uh, but still, most of it that are published in our journal are still quantitative uh, 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 research papers. Right. Uh, I will leave you to that. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Over thank to you, Nora. You. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Prof. Lau, for that uh, wonderful, very informative session. Uh, in fact, I can see in one of the Q&A, a participant actually asked, can we have a special program or course, a short course on qualitative? So it might be something that APEC yes. might want to consider next year. Right. <laughs> Participants are really looking forward to this uh, a more in-depth uh, session on qualitative research. Uh, I have uh, quite a few questions for you, so I'll, I'll start with the questions. Yes, yes please. Uh, the first one is on qualitative analysis. Uh, should one use a manual type of analysis or is it a must to use the tools that you mentioned, the NVivo or Atlas? Yeah, uh, when you're talking about data uh, you know, analysis, you have voluminous data, you know, as far as qualitative research is concerned. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, just a ballpark figure for one hour of interview. Yeah, it comes up to 20, 30 pages yeah, of data that you have, just one hour of interview. When you're doing the transcription, you get somebody to transcribe it. Yeah, the whole one hour can consist of 20, 30 pages. So you can imagine the amount of interview that you have. Say, for instance, you have conducted 20 interviews and you can imagine the number of pages that you have to analyze. So it would be best to have a software, yeah, to help you to analyze it, rather to do it ma uh, manually. Those were the days, you know, uh, uh, we don't have all these softwares. Yeah, uh, the anthropologists or the sociologists will use different types of colors. Okay, let's say, for instance, uh, you know, uh, you're looking at, you know, sexuality and uh, you use pink for abortion. So when you read anything abortion, you paint it pink and you put it on the floor. So pink signifies abortion. So you have green, green is, for instance, premarital sex. So when you look at green, you know, it's all represent, you know, premarital sex. So those were the days, that's how they code the data. But right now, you know, with all this sophistication, uh, you know, with the software, it would be much, much easier if you have a software to help you manage, you know, all your data that you have. So I would advise, you know, uh, anyone who's doing qualitative, you know, to use, uh, uh, you know, qualitative uh, data analysis software. All my students who are doing qualitative, they do use a software to help them manage the data. If not, you know, it can be very troublesome, you know, very burdensome because you have huge amount of data. But of course, it comes with a price on this software. Yeah, uh, you know, at least, you know, 1,500 US dollars. Uh, of course, the more user you buy, it will be cheaper, but there are also other free software as well. So if you don't have money, use a free software, you know, that helps you to manage all, all your data. Thank you, Prof. Lau. It's very interesting to listen to the story of how it used to, people used to analyze uh, qualitative data 
where you have to actually put it on the floor and then have cardboards yes. and make sections on where you put the analysis. That's, that's very, very interesting. Uh, reminds me also on the references. Uh, I remember we used to use yeah. Taipei as references. So that was during the caveman times. And I would really tell, uh, suggest to all the audience, please use all the softwares that Prof. Colin Bins mentioned just now. Yeah, especially very much so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question, Prof. Lau. This yes. is regarding results. Now, uh, someone is doing an analysis and the results does not actually saturate. So can one actually uh, publish the paper or what should what should the person do? Yeah. Um, now, uh, we only stop our interviewing, our focus group discussion or face-to-face -face interview when you have reached a saturation point. So if you have not reached a saturation point, that is not the end of your study. So you have to carry on, you, you know, until you really feel that a saturation point has been reached. So I'm not exactly sure why the study, you know, ended, you know, without reaching saturation point. It would be very difficult because if any reviewer were to read that session, you know, then I think uh, the acceptance of the paper would be extremely slim. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, Here's another question from Nadika. Uh, she's asking if we were to wish, if we wish to report the findings of a one-day workshop in a qualitative manner, should she write it as a full original article or should it just come under short communications? Yeah, uh, it all depends on what she's trying to report. Uh, like for instance, uh, we are running this workshop and he tried to analyze what is being discussed here. Yeah. Uh, unless she's also, you know, uh, posting questions uh, to the participants and then the participants, you know, uh, sort of answer it in, in, in the check box or whatever. Then if he's using those data, that would be an original paper. But if not, he can just write a short commentary. He can, you know, give uh, or even a letter to the editor commenting on the workshop that he has attended. Yeah. Yeah. So it all depends on the objective of what he's trying to convey uh, in analyzing that workshop that she has attended. That's very clear. Thank you, Prof. Uh, here's another one. This is regarding uh, using uh, a writing a qualitative uh, paper or manuscript. Should one use a question as a title or, or a heading or should she just use a, a sentence? What, what is better? Uh, no, this is for the title of the paper, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, the title of paper, you know, uh, can even be a question. It's really up to, uh, uh, you know, up to him or her. So it can be a question, you know, uh, uh, should women come in uh, late for breast cancer surgery, for instance, question mark, uh, a grounded theory approach, something like that. Uh, so yes, to answer a question, it can be, you know, a question form or, uh, you know, uh, uh, views and experiences of a breast cancer woman coming late for surgery. That is a statement, yeah? And so uh, it can vary. Yeah, it can be both. Yeah. So it can be both. It doesn't have to be. Uh, yes. One yeah. It doesn't other. have to be just a question or just a sentence. Yeah. Now this is regarding ethical ethical issues. Um, Sonali would like to ask you whether could you explain a little bit more about ethical aspects of conducting participant observation. Yeah, uh, this is very important because uh, sometimes you know you may be going to a community, you may be going to a village. Yeah, uh, to observe certain practices uh, that is happening, in, you know, in, in, in a certain community. Now, it's very important, first of all, you know, penetrating into the community or the village. Uh, you do need permission, yeah, from, let's say, uh, 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 for instance, in Malaysia will be the Kotua Kampong, or in a certain villages, it will be the headman. So I think it's important for you to get permission, you know, from the headman before you actually enter uh, 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 the, the, the village to actually observe whatever you're observing. So I think that, uh, you know, a permission needs to be obtained, very important. And when you're observing things and whatnot, you know, it's important to be very mindful, you know, of all those practices, uh, all, the, all the rituals that, that is done in a certain community, yeah, and, and not go there and disrupt, you know, all their, uh, 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 their normal routine or their normal practices or their rituals. So I think uh, ethics is uh, very important. Yeah, and this is just participation observation. But if it's an interview, again, the former, you know, thing of, you know, applying for research ethics from your own university. Uh, if it's a clinic outside there or a hospital, you need to apply it uh, probably from your own Ministry of Health, you know, for ethics approval. 
yeah and also uh, that is ethics for your study but dealing with participants uh, you know themselves you do need to have informed consent very important yeah this is also uh, moving on, uh, linking to this, the same issue that you are ask uh, that you're mentioning just now this is regarding participants taking part in research uh, when is it appropriate to pay participants taking part in research and how much or how, how do I determine the appropriate amount uh, for payment to these participants uh, while conducting focus group discussion? Yeah, I, I think that's a very pertinent question because sometimes re researcher thinks that, oh my word, you know, uh, you have huge amount of uh, a research grant and you want to pay so much of money, you know, to the participants. Now, then again, you know, you will question then the validity of the answer. Is the participant taking part in my study because of the research per se or because of the money I'm giving them or because of the token, you know, uh, the, the, the financial, the monetary, in, uh, you know, honorarium I'm giving them. So again, I think all this, you know, can actually uh, affect, yeah, the, you know, the, the kind of response that you're getting from the uh, participants. Uh, in my own uh, project, you know, uh, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, I merely give them a token of appreciation. I call it a token of appreciation, yeah, uh, for me to reimburse them if they come, you know, uh, to the university for an interview and they are taking a grab or a taxi or a bus, you know, and even if they are using their own uh, car, they be paying for their own petrol. So to me, it's just reimbursement, you know, of whatever they have spent. So it's just a small token of appreciation for their attendance in, you know, in, 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 in my research. Yeah, and obviously, you, you know, I don't have huge amount of research grant that I give them lots and lots of money. So again, it all depends on, and sometimes you don't even have to give in a form of money. You can give in kind, yeah? You know, you can give them a box of biscuits, you know, uh, wherever you're going. So it all depends on, you know, how much money, how much budget you have in your, in your research. Yeah. So, so I guess in COVID times nowadays, since we don't uh, see participants face to face, it's using yeah. online. So it's online for their online uh, subscription or data plan that they they're using while talking to you, I suppose. So yeah. And, and, and again, I think uh, because of all this uh, online survey coming up, you know, uh, Survey Monkey, Google Survey, or what have you, uh, it, it's this whole question of how valid are those uh, findings? Who are those who are actually participating in all this online uh, uh, research? So it's a actually big question when you're talking about online research in terms of validity of the findings as well. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Exactly. I've got another question following that as well. I think there are quite a few ethical questions uh, from the participants. This is regarding um, a person who has conducted qualitative paper, uh, qualitative research and she would like to present a qualitative paper in a conference. Uh, but this paper is also under review in a journal. So is this practice ethical or is there any implications for plagiarism? Uh, uh, no, uh, because what happened is, uh, like for instance, sometimes we would normally uh, present a paper at a conference, yeah, and from there we would normally encourage our students or you know the academics to actually write it up uh, to to be published in the paper. But I think uh, because sometimes you know the conference might come later, uh, the candidate, my the students might have submitted the paper and then the conference comes later and then he's only presenting it. But it's still under the review stage, yeah. So it's not that the results is out yet or whatsoever, and uh, the findings have not been presented anywhere. And so it would be—it's actually a good practice to share, you know, uh, uh, your findings to disseminate your findings uh, via a conference or through publication. So I wouldn't call that a, a plagiarism, yeah. Especially now when uh, during COVID times we've got a lot of conferences that have been pushed. Uh, due to COVID issues, right, Rufla? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Um, uh, this person is asking about impact factor. Uh, she's recently heard about impact factor and found out that Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health has very good impact factor. So what, what are the advantages or disadvantages of publishing in a journal that has a good impact factor compared to one without any or, or with a lower impact factor? 
Yeah, uh, well, there are a few issues here. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud, I'm sure, together with Professor Colin Baines, who's the editor-in-chief now, uh, we have actually brought this journal of Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health from nothing, you know, uh, right until it is now in text, both in Scopus and WOS Web of Science. Now, uh, our impact factor, in fact, I think about uh, two years ago, it was 1.765. And last year, it has actually gone down to 1.255. Even that, you know, I think the impact factor is, is, is still really good. Now, so what are the advantages of, you know, going into a journal that has got a high impact factor compared to the journal, yeah, another public health journal that has got a very low impact factor or a journal without any impact factor at all. Now, it boils down to the word citation, very important. Uh, now, bear in mind, you know, my journal is in-text both in Scopus and in WOS Web of Science or what we call the ISI in-text journal. Now, under this uh, ISI WOS in-text journal, it has been categorized under social science citation in-text and science citation in-text. So basically, those social sciences, uh, you know, people are reading our journal and under the science citation in-text, all the journals that are in-text in that are actually seeing our journal. So it gives you the visibility of your article. So if your article is published in this journal, a lot of people will read it, they will see it, and they might even cite your paper, yeah? So it gives it a visibility of your, your article, yeah? So because a lot of people will be reading the journal, yeah? Uh, so, so, so that's one thing. So it actually helps you uh, with the citation uh, uh, as well. Now, uh, very important, the higher the impact factor is, the harder is it for you to get in, yeah, the, the article. Uh, you, you, you can look at, you know, BMJ, you can look at, you know, New England Journal uh, of Medicine, yeah. Uh, so, so those journals, you know, are very high ranking and uh, you, you, you can always try to get in, but the chances of getting in will be extremely slim. But if you can get in, wow, that's fantastic, you know, and, and it, it will give you the age, yeah. Uh, you know, like for instance, Lancet and, and uh, what have you. So really, I think uh, it's, you try to aim, you know, for a high impact factor, but failing which, you know, uh, like sometimes I would advise my students find the aim for that high ranking journal. So if you submit to let's say journal A with a high impact factor and it gets rejected, you move now to a different level, you know, the second level yeah, journal. And then you get rejected, you move, you know, to another, you know, layer of, of, of journal. Yeah, yeah. And so, so yeah. that's how, you know, you would advise, uh, that's how I advise my students as far as publication is concerned. So there are lots of benefit if you can, you know, get into a, a, a high impact factor journal. But again, I think all this differs between from one institution to another institution. In certain institution, you know, higher learning institution, they are new still require them to at least send it to uh, an impact factor of, of how much. So with that, you have no choice, but you have to pick out journals with a certain impact factor because your, then your university would recognize your publication. All right. So again, it depends on uh, university requirement as well. If you're coming from a university. Thanks, Prof. Lau. That's, that's very informative. So for all the audience out there, uh, start writing your manuscript and publishing uh, and sending them to Asia Pacific Journal of Public Health. Uh, I've got one last question for you, Prof. Lau. Yes. Uh, um, actually, there, there are many more questions. I don't know whether you can answer all of them. <laughs> but this is from Ganga, and he wants to know. How do you define the validity of uh, qualitative results or, uh, or results using qualitative methods when studies now have to be done online because of COVID, uh, of the, 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 the reasons that we're facing? So how, how do you ensure yeah. validity? Right. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, uh, because we, okay, let us now just concentrate on qualitative here, yeah? you know, even though it's an online. Say, for instance, you are doing an interview yeah, you know, online interview, yeah, or to telephone interview, yeah, again, how do you prove, you know, it's trustworthiness, yeah, of a certain thing. So once I have, let's conduct an interview with this particular person, this particular stakeholder, then you can go on and interview, you know, his peers or his uh, superior, you know, about a certain aspect, you know, of the study. So in a way, you're actually triangulating the data. All right. So whatever the stakeholder told you, you know, you verifying it, you know, by interviewing his peers or interviewing his superior. Yeah. 
So we are talking about interviews here, yeah? This is a qualitative research. So in a way, this is how you test is uh, uh, trustworthiness. Uh, we call it trustworthiness rather than validity. Validity, the term you use is also very important when you're writing up, all right? Uh, so this is one way, or you can do a memo check, you know, and you can, you know, check uh, with reports or whatever, you know, from the institution, the stakeholders, the interviewee that you have interviewed. So all this is what we call triangulation. Yeah, you do need to triangulate because if not, then there is no verification of whatever the person say is, is you know, is the truth. Yeah, so again, this is how you verify the information. Well, thank you, Prof. Lau. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed this, this session. And uh, I think there's a lot of information that the audience actually picked up. The tips on how do you conduct research, uh, the ethical issues, especially now that we face during COVID times, and what you should do to ensure that your study is still uh, trustworthy, valid, and uh, avoiding all the biases or the limitations that we, uh, we, we face. Thank you so much. Well, right. Let's move on to our third speaker. Um, we have Dr. BJC Pereira, who is now the past president of Sri Lanka Medical Association. He is um, he has a long uh, CV here that I have with me today. Uh, he was the founder president of Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, founder president of Respiratory Disease Study Group of Sri Lanka, currently now the section edition of Ceylon Medical Journal, joint editor of the Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health, joint editor of the Proceedings of Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, annual scientific congress member, international advisory board of current pediatrics, reviewer of Sri Lanka Journal of Medicine, member of the International Review Board of Archives of Disease in Childhood, and member international reviews panel of Medi medical science uh, monitor. Uh, and uh, a long, even longer list of uh, CV here we have. Uh, and uh, he's definitely, um, someone that you would want to listen to. He has lots of experience and his session will be on what do editors want in Thank submission you. to their journals. So over to you, Dr. BJC. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? It's loud and clear. Thank you very much. Thank you for those um, uh, rather excellent uh, words of introduction, perhaps a little bit undeserved. Um, uh, and I also must, uh, first of all, at the outset, uh, thank uh, the APAC and the organizers, uh, because I'm not directly involved in the work of the APAC because I'm a pediatrician uh, with a special interest in, uh, in childhood respiratory diseases. So I consider it a really great privilege to have been asked to uh, speak in this uh, workshop. Uh, before I really get on to the nitty gritty of my presentation, um, there I must apologize, there might be a little bit of um, overlap uh, with uh, some of the things, uh, the excellent presentation by Professor Bins. Uh, and also, I would like to compliment uh, Professor Lowe on her last slide, where the thank you slide, the very first line was in the native language of Sri Lanka, that is Sinhala. So that was beautifully done, and uh, it was lovely to see. And we from Sri Lanka, I was so grateful to you. Now, um, my job really today is to talk to you about what do editors want in submissions to their journals. So this is more or less a, a little bit of a behind the scenes approach. Uh, that's why I said there might be a little bit of overlap with especially uh, with uh, what uh, Professor Bin said. Uh, at the outset, let me make a declaration because some of these slides that I would be using were very kindly provided by Dr. Anuruddha Abhigunasekara, editor emeritus of the Ceylon Medical Journal. Uh, that is to prevent anybody sort of um, accusing me of plagiarism uh, in my presentation. Um, now, we have all heard these research publications have always been an important key uh, to building a successful career in science. Um, and this is as we have heard over and over again, uh, that's particularly true in academic environments, especially in the universities. But then nobody really seriously thinks about uh, the editor's job, actually. 
because editors of journals, uh, although they 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 they, are, they have uh, they are the important people about publications, that they play a very crucial role in the publication processes. <clears throat> so I think we need to initially look a little bit at the editorial responsibilities. Um, they have to ensure the, I put down a whole range of uh, things uh, that uh, uh, editors' responsibilities consist of, uh, to starting with the uh, ensuring of integrity of the published academic record. I think that really uh, is the, the beginning and the end of it all, really. It is a responsibility that all editors carry. So there are all the other things that come down after that, which I have listed in this slide. Uh, last, but certainly by no means least in this, um, in this entire um, list of things, that the editors also have to be accountable for what appears in their journal. So it is res the editor, he or she is responsible for what appears in his or her journal. And therefore, over the years and in very many parts of the world, um, that uh, the editors have been uh, responsible for asking, regardless of the scientific field, that they should be given full independence and powers to make editorial decisions on individual manuscripts, because they are the ones who ultimately carry the responsibility on their shoulders. Now, initially, I think, you know, people don't know much about editors, uh, really. Uh, what kind of people are they? Very often, they are renowned researchers in their own right and generally well, well qualified in a given discipline, especially if it is a specialist journal. Um, they are generally quite reasonable and fair with perhaps uh, odd exceptions, but uh, very often they are a moderating influence on the uh, rest of the people who are involved in publishing a journal and they will generally safeguard the journal. And majority are not uh, uh, quite contrary to popular belief. They're not autocratic and uh, they're not alone to themselves. Uh, they have, <laughs> so to speak, uh, generally volunteered for punishment because uh, uh, so much work goes into being an editor, uh, but obviously they do that because they invariably love the job. Uh, there are very many, types of articles that editors have to deal with. Uh, and these include uh, going down from editorials uh, to letters, uh, correspondence, and a whole list of things that I've listed here. But I think as far as this uh, August uh, audience is concerned, uh, I think what is of uh, essence is the other uh, research papers and the original articles. I think that's what we, I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on. Um, if you ask the question, are journal editors and authors aligned that uh, they, they understand each other? Uh, editors would very often say no, actually, because the you'll find uh, that the authors um, uh, do not really see uh, it uh, as eye to eye with what editors do. Um, if you ask, do editor, uh, journal editors really understand the challenges authors were? Many authors would say no, because it has been over the years, the general impression that editors are uh, God's own gift to science, and uh, therefore that they do not take into account the, uh, the kind of problems that the authors have. Uh, but, Although the main authors would say that, if you ask the same question uh, from the editors, they would very often say that the answer is yes, they do understand the problems because uh, they are well aware of the challenges because most of them uh, have been researchers in their own right. So they know the problems that the, uh, the authors have, have in uh, doing research. So now, we come to the nitty gritty of things. What do these editors really want? Because ultimately you want to get your research paper published. So you need to know what the editors are really looking for. So here we are uh, from the point of view of someone who has been uh, doing uh, 
some amount of medical editing for almost a quarter of a century. Uh, here's some of the things that go on virtually in the background. Um, now, virtually almost in lighter vein that editors actually like a good story. Your research paper should look like a really good story. It's something like this. Um, once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess in a wonderful kingdom. One day she met a handsome young prince from the adjoining kingdom. They fell in love and got married. They produced six lovely children. All of them lived happily ever after. Now, these are the kind of fairy story that children are used to. And quite surprisingly, uh, this is very similar, not identical, to what we as editors also look for. So I will come to this, uh, this kind of story uh, uh, in a little while again. Um, there are certain main components of a research paper. I will not uh, dwell too much on this because you have already heard most of this from Professor Bins. Um, but uh, when you look at the title, I think he did mention this, that it has to be brief but descriptive. And uh, catchy phrases are, are always useful because it, it, it evokes the interest of the editor as well as later on if it is published, uh, in the readership. Uh, but of course, you don't want to use kind of outrageous titles. Uh, so non-outrageous, catchy titles are rather nice. And abstract, you have already heard that it has to be structured into these uh, different segments. Um, keywords, again, I think Professor Bain spent quite a lot of time on this. So I'm not going to talk very much on that. The main body, really real writing uh, of the paper starts here. Uh, you again have the uh, introduction, objectives, method, results, discussions, conclusion. These vary from journal to journal, but um, generally uh, this is the kind of format that they want. References are always required in a designated style in the journals, and they specify this. Uh, figures and tables, the caption for a figure, this is something very important, most people don't realize, the caption for a figure should appear below the graphic. And the caption for a table should be above the table. And this is something that many people get confused with and they, they, they kind of you know, put the wrong things in the wrong place. And I think the easiest way that I remember is that uh, to prevent it going wrong, that just remember table talk. So anything uh, about a table, the legend comes at the top. And of course, it finishes off with the acknowledgements. The main body of the paper, the content, really should be organized like a good story with a beginning, the middle, and an end. So I come back to this fairy story again. Should conform to author guidelines. I think this is very important. Professor Bin stressed this, uh, that, uh, that you really have to read the author guidelines very carefully and uh, scrupulously stick to the details that are required. The organizing the content, now it is uh, like the beginning, the middle and the end. Why did you start? What did you want to do? That is included in the introduction, the background and the objectives. And in the middle of your paper, what did you actually do? That is included in the method. And what did you find is given in the results? And in the end, what does it really mean? What, uh, what do all your efforts add up to? Uh, there is a discussion, which is basically the interpretation of your results. Uh, and then conclusion, they should be based on the objectives and the results and not on anything else. It, is, it, it does not require you to say uh, your difficulties in conducting this research or how very nice it was to do this bit of research, none of that, but it has to be scientifically concluded with the objectives and the results. Uh, we have heard about the IMRAD format, about introduction, methods, results, and discussion. But I would like to suggest to you, because nowadays most journals would uh, also put in the objective. So it becomes IMRAD, um, where introduction, objectives, methods, results, and discussion are the real basic uh, thing of uh, the scientific paper. So I come back to my original story, once upon a time type of thing. And how does a research paper actually fit into this kind of thing? I promised you that I would get back to this. Um, 
and that's where it comes. Now, once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess. Now, that's the beginning. One day she met someone and they produced, they got uh, married and produced six children. That's the middle bit. And then all of them lived happily ever after. That's the ending. That's the kind of thing uh, that would be very um, attractive uh, to an editor. So here I have put in the components of the paper into our story where uh, you have the introduction coming in there. Then you have the objectives and the method then the results, and then the discussion and the conclusion. So that's how your research paper would fit in uh, to our hypothetical fairy story. Now, what do editors really want in your paper? There are certain major criteria that most editors would look for. And one thing that would make a paper very attractive and uh, would score very heavily uh, to uh, towards uh, ultimate pub publication is a newness, novelty, or uniqueness of the research that has been done. So if it is something entirely new, again, you're starting straight away from a very, very positive balance. Then trueness, have you really declared everything that has been done um, properly uh, without uh, any other constraints that the trueness of what you have really done and produced in your scientific paper. The importance of it. Now, certain studies we know over the years uh, in scientific literature have been groundbreaking studies. They have broken new ground. So that kind of thing would be very attractive to a journal. And then precision and clarity of writing. The very special style of scientific writing, I'll come to this in a moment. Um, there are certain other criteria that uh, we editors also look for, the appropriateness for the readership uh, to fit in with the aims and scope of the journal. I think that's uh, quite important. So when you look at the, the website details of a journal, you know uh, what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Uh, and obviously, we expect you to avoid all types of research misconduct and plagiarism. Uh, the style of writing, the language that is used in presentation of your research paper becomes quite important for, for us editors. Then the brevity the, or the conciseness of what you have written, um, we will be dealing with this in a little while. Uh, and adherence, obviously, to the journals or the guidelines, as I said earlier, scrupulously. Um, appropriateness for the journal. Um, the general journals would prefer articles for the generalists, but can include certain specialist articles as well. And an example is uh, one of our own journals from Sri Lanka, the Ceylon Medical Journal, um, which is a general journal. They will consider uh, submissions from almost any type of uh, topic in medicine. Then you have the specialist journals, uh, which would confine itself to articles on a broad subject area. And again, a journal that I work with uh, Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health. These are the two journals that I work with mainly. Um, and Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health will, will um, uh, consider articles on children and young people and adolescents up to the international cutoff year for children, which is 18 years. Then you have ultra specialist journals which would confine the articles to a very highly restricted selected area. Like the Annals of Pediatric Cardiology, they will deal with only cardiological issues in, in children. So you have all types of journals. Now, plagiarism, I think um, it is true to say almost all medical editors have virtually zero tolerance for plagiarism. And now there are very many um, uh, types of software that one would use to actually um, uh, try and assess as to whether there is any plagiarism. Um, and the style of writing, the actually the classical style of scientific writing is a triad, uh, which is the one that is most attractive to editors. Uh, the three things are use simple language, be as brief as possible or concise, and avoid unnecessary verbosity. 
brevity and clarity that means you know sort of you make it very short concise and clear so you are uh, you are expected to use the shortest possible text cut down on superfluous words be concise and use short sentences and use simple words uh, because readers should not need a dictionary to understand your article right because if you use too many high powered uh, sort of grandiose sounding words uh, that the your readership the people who read your article may not quite understand it uh, and i know professor bin said uh, that uh, uh, that you had to keep on writing to improve your writing skills but also you go on reading as well to improve your your skills in writing i think reading uh, here i have put reading makes writing very easy Ex extensive reading uh, over the years uh, will make you a very good writer then of course there are these things uh, which are diplomatically called typographical errors uh, quite often they are not actually typographical errors they are really virtually rubbish that has crept into research papers and uh, things like poor english uh, we are very diplomatic and uh, virtually condescending in in calling them typographical errors um now i said short and simple sentences and certainly about 20 or less number of words for a sentence the, the 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 shorter the better basically if a sentence is too long break it into two or three or even five sentences that's perfectly all right because it will then become even clearer uh, for the people who read your paper now just one example uh, a 35 year old man a farmer presented with fever and jaundice which he noticed about one month ago following admission to hospital for assessment and investigation of abdominal pain and was found to have gallstones which however were uh, not causing bile duct obstruction which was also confirmed by normal leo function test 54 words for this sentence and this is really a real life situation this is from uh, a submission which we got to the, the Ceylon Medical Journal. Now, all that is said in this, this uh, extensive sort of 54 word, uh, uh, virtually a paragraph, is what it means is a 35 year old farmer had fever and jaundice one month ago, a sentence of 12 words. At that time, he had gallstones without bile duct obstruction and normal Leo function test, 16 words. I'm sure. Uh, the members of the audience would realize how clear it is the second one when you break it up and make it short and simple. Then also use simple words. Don't complicate it by using uh, very, very long words uh, and also sort of what many people call esoteric words. You don't want to uh, regularly use uh, words like approximately, in order to, possess, prior to, demonstrate, ameliorate. Whereas the simpler words of the same thing are uh, like what I have put here. About in order to just can be said as to. Possess is to have. Prior to is before. Demonstrate is to show. Ameliorate is to improve. So much simpler. Many people would understand and would really like to read. Uh, something that is written in these lines. And also, many people do this uh, padding of uh, 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 Now, the, here's a, another example. Uh, a considerable proportion of subjects in the cohort of patients reported here in this study developed a visible hematuria when their urine samples were examined. A very high sounding kind of sentence. But all that it means is many patients actually developed hematuria. As simple as that. Although it has been padded up uh, into a very long sentence, which uh, the authors were probably hoping that uh, would catch the eye of uh, the editor and they would look at it the same way. We don't. We want it nice and simple without any padding. When then another example is that it is plainly and clearly demonstrable from the observed study data of the subjects that are presented in table two. 
all that the author is trying to say is table two shows. You, you see how nice it is when it is nice and simple. And avoid unnecessary verbosity. Now people put in this kind of phrases in this relevant and specific text as a matter of fact. It has to be mentioned that. It can be said clearly and unequivocally that something is happening. The whole point of exercise is, it seems to be obvious and crystal clear that, you know, uh, this is verbosity that they hope uh, would improve or kind of beautify the paper. It doesn't always work like that. And it's always uh, necessary to avoid superfluous words. Now, here's another example. It has been clearly and conclusively noted from an extensive survey of the printed and electronic literature that during the protracted period of time that the annuria lasts, the level of platelets are often, very often, elevated in excess of the normal range in a vast majority of patients. A long winded uh, sentence, uh, which is of 48 words. All that the author is trying to say, either studies have shown that in the majority, while anuria lasts, the platelet count is abnormally raised. 16 words, which will give uh, an, uh, very nicely the exact meaning of what I've been said in the earlier paragraph. And uh, <clears throat> avoid long, long words. The longest word in the English language is pneumono ultramicroscopics silico volcano coniosis. If you can really pronounce that. Uh, as I said, it's the longest word in the English language. And what it means is pneumoconiosis uh, caused by the inhalation of silica dust or quartz dust into the lungs. Well, you can equally easily call it silicosis and the same meaning will be conveyed. However, there are certain words you cannot help but use it, they are rather long. Pseudo, pseudo hypoparathyroidism. There is no other word that can be used for this. This is pseudo hypoparathyroidism, which has a normal calcium and phosphate levels as well. So uh, by that uh, terminology, this specifically describes an, uh, an entity. So you are forced to use that, unlike the earlier one. Also, you have to try and avoid using ridiculous statements. The patient noticed that his feces had an offensive smell. <laughs> Which person passes feces uh, that does not have a rather offensive smell? Obviously, uh, a rather ridiculous statement. Depressed individuals may fail to decrease sadness. So naturally, if you are depressed, depressed uh, that uh, you're likely to be sad. Then live specimens of the larvae were found in the feces as well as in the fruits. It's very um, uh, sort of problematic when you use uh, these combinations of feces as well as fruits. It doesn't really look good. Scientists noted that there were differences between the sexes. Obviously, there are differences between the sexes. You don't have to actually put it down. There, are, there may be certain differences in certain types of uh, uh, presentations, activities, appearance, everything between the sexes, obviously. But then when you put it like this, that it, it looks ridiculous. And there were three kinds of subjects in the study, one lot who were athletic and the other two who were not, and the other who, who were not. What happened to the third one? If you make a statement about two out of three, you have to specify what happened to the third one as well. The patients were not afraid of being scared. So obviously, afraid, being afraid and being scared, uh, you are really using the same terminology. Uh, this is the one I really like. Some subjects did not want to eat lobsters because they were alive when they were killed. Obviously, you can't kill a second time a killed uh, a lobster. So, you know, it looks very ridiculous. Then, obviously, I think uh, Professor Bins also mentioned this, uh, your, your language tense is important. Research papers should be written in the past tense as the work has already been done. Uh, all patients had jaundice, all were jaundice, that kind of thing. So the bottom line is that academic scientific writing should be precise, accurate, concise, 
and presented in simple, grammatically correct language. Even if you forget everything else that I have said so far, you just remember this. I think that will stand you in good stead. So before you submit an article to a journal, read the author guidelines of the journal. Also read a few articles uh, as uh, uh, also that uh, Professor Bins uh, uh, stressed at the beginning in that journal so that you get an idea of the style that is required. And very important, adhere to those instructions and stick to the style. There are certain finer points expected by editors compliance in addition to compliance with author guidelines written in proper Queen's English for certain journals which have United Kingdom uh, English as their base. But of course, some journals use uh, uh, English US. So depending on the journal, I think you may have to set your, your language uh, uh, sort of processing software in the thing, in, in the computer uh, to either English UK or English US when you start to type uh, your paper. And remember that the default language in most computer systems now are US English. Uh, and of course, ethical clearance, clinical trials, registration, we have all talked about this. Method and results to be clearly presented. Discussion should be fruitful based on the results and include comparisons with available data from elsewhere. That's basically the, the, the crux of a uh, uh, discussion. The conclusions, as I said, based on objectives and the results. References, all relevant references and style as per guidelines. And there are certain special uh, considerations, validation of tools that you have used, validations of questionnaires. Uh, and this thing, if it is a study that has been done for the first time in the world, fine, say that, and that will get a lot of prominence and a lot of positive uh, positives about your paper. But then for us in Sri Lanka, doing something for the first time in Sri Lanka, which have been done maybe many times elsewhere in the world, does not carry all that much of weight. A situation where there is very little data in the world and also from Sri Lanka, perhaps that might be a, a plus point which will be considered by the editors. And obviously, we expect every single researcher to be not engaged in any research misconduct or plagiarism. Now, you might justifiably ask, why do all these editors want all this? This is, I think, is true of most editors, what I have said, that these are the things that they would like to have. Why do editors want all this? Are they stupid? Or do they have a poor command of the Queen's language? Is that the reason? that they want it simplified. I think it will be fair to say that they are fairly intelligent um, and they have a fairly reasonable command of the English language. But we have to remember that they have to cater to their readers, keep things simple, and it involves journal space, especially for print editions of the journal. And they have to maintain the consistency of the published articles and maintain the required standards. So because of those only that all editors would like to have what I have said so far. I think once again, quite contrary to popular belief, most editors, almost all of them, they really want to help the research. Um, and this has to be tempered by the fact that they do have responsibilities to the journal, to authors and readers, publishing organizations, science in general, and to the society as a whole. A few are only are abrasive and ill-mannered. They are a very rare breed of editors nowadays, actually for them to be abrasive and ill-mannered. Um, and uh, editors um, uh, quite often uh, get brickbats and accolades, and brickbats much more, much more than the accolades for the work they do. Now, this is an example of a, 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 a letter uh, that I would write uh, while rejecting a paper. So this is about a submission titled whatever. And I would start by saying thank you so much for the above listed submission to our journal. It is with much regret that I have to inform you that following careful review of the paper, 
it had been decided that it would not be possible to accept the paper for publication in the journal. The reviewers were blinded during the review process and their comments and suggestions are attached. We hope very much that these will be useful to you. We are hopeful that you will be able to secure publication of your work depicted in this paper in another suitable journal. We do hope that you will consider our journal for future submissions of your work too. With the very best of personal regards, yours sincerely and signed myself as the joint editor of the Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health. So you can see the tone that is implied on this. I'm ever so sorry to do this, but I'm virtually forced to do it. But this may be the letter that I may have to write about a paper which consists where the content was virtually absolute rubbish. But I wouldn't ever dare call that rubbish to that author. Because one thing, it'll hurt the person. And the second thing, which is very, very important to me as an editor, is that that person will never ever again submit a research paper to our journal. And that is very important to me because, okay, this time he may have submitted some rubbish, but the next time it may be a really good quality paper, which I as an editor would be privileged to publish in my journal. So I don't want to let go of that chance. So that is why we don't become uh, kind of very nasty and abrasive. In summary, what do editors really want? After all this talking for maybe a little close to 40 minutes now, a good new and original story with a beginning, middle and end, and be as brief as possible because editors do not like and people, the readership also do not like or read long articles in simple language with adherence to journals, instructions to authors and with a reasonable take home message. I have not mentioned this so far, but if your paper or your work can produce uh, some sort of very reasonable take home message about how something should be managed or how um, uh, a different type of treatment may have advantages or the accepted things, something that will tickle the interest of the readership. That is what we really want. So your conclusion sometimes should have, or would, would be nice to have a take home message. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, it has been once again such a privilege to talk to you. Uh, and I would say good luck with your submissions uh, carrying our national flower in our hands. Now, many people believe that uh, the authors of scientific uh, papers are just one breed. It is not so. Some would be head and shoulders taller than the others. Some are extremely good at it. And they have not become good because of their genes or because that's the way they have been born or anything like that. That is through sheer hard work, actually. That is so important to realize that some authors are, are, are cut uh, above all the others. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And those of you who are asleep can wake up now. As for the others, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. BJC. That was really wonderful. I, I really enjoyed your story of uh, how editors love a good story and the last sentence that they all live happily ever after. I've got a few questions for you from the audience. Um, okay. The first one is on uh, is from Sonali and he, he would like to know, uh, would you recommend any reliable plagiarism check software for author? Um, yes, there are, there are lots of uh, plagiarism um, uh, checking software. In fact, in our journal, uh, you know, in the journals that I work with, uh, we use the Crossref uh, um, uh, uh, authenticate uh, software where you can uh, actually check it using filters. You know, you can set the filter to say five words, 10 words, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I cannot tell you the, the names of any of the other 
types of uh, uh, software that you can use because we have not been using but if you look in the internet there are, there are a whole load uh, but of course uh, most of them uh, would need a subscription uh, but uh, we uh, we are very fortunate in our journals in sri lanka we got this facility uh, uh, free uh, through the our our uh, what i would call the godmother organization of the international network for the accessibility of um, of scientific publications uh, mm -hmm. from oxford uh, who originally got us uh, this platform of sri lanka journals online so uh, it's given free to us so uh, mm -hmm. i use it uh, uh, in fact all all um, submissions to the sri lanka journal of child health comes to me directly first uh, and then i run all these things through that look at it as well and then only send it to the uh, my uh, other uh, co-joint editor, uh, and there he takes over and then processes it from then on. Uh, that's uh, the conveyor belt on which that particular journal works. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's very useful to all the audience to hear. There are many out there in the, uh, you can always check which one that's available in from your institutions or maybe uh, some of the free ones that you are able to, to use or um, even if I can just use. mention something else about plagiarism, I think uh, uh, people very often misunderstand the the implications or the meaning of the word plagiarism. Uh, it does not mean that you cannot use what that has been earlier published or the thoughts of another person, provided you are good enough to attribute it and cite that reference and give due credit to that person and do not make it look as if it is your own work or your own thoughts, right? If you do that with transparency like that, there is no problem. Then there is also one form of plagiarism, which I have been uh, rather cagey about. Uh, they call it self-plagiarism, your own work that has been quoted. What else do you do? I mean, if it is relevant. Um, but then again, you you quote the reference and cite that in, in, in whatever you say. And very often people would use um, quotes or inverted commas uh, to make it look definitely like as if it has been done by someone else. Then they are, So when you do a plagiarism check, and even we as editors, we have to look at it very carefully how it is done because the plagiarism checking software only detects that it has been taken from some other publication or from somewhere else. It doesn't do anything more than that. It only brings it to your attention. So it's up to you as editors or editorial assistants or whoever is dealing with this to look critically at what the program has detected. So I think that is essential. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Dr. PJC. It's it's uh, technology will never uh, substitute a human human brain. Oh right? yes, but I've, <laughs> I've always said that. Um, I don't know. Uh, many technological experts may may fight with me for this. I, I have said that um, basically computers are dumb machines. You put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. There's nothing, nothing on earth that can compare with the human brain. Exactly. Here's another question uh, from one of the participants. Now, this is regarding a journal. Some research journals actually demand that author pay a certain amount of fee to publish with them. And he's uh, referring to the open access model. And if not, um, you would have to pay your, I mean, you, you would have to submit your, um, your publications or manuscripts to other journals. Now, his, his question is, why do we pay research journals for publishing our work with them? Uh, I think this is this is this really is a problem um, because now our journals that we have are complete hundred uh, percent full access open text. Now you we don't charge a processing uh, at least the Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health does not charge a processing fee either. So some journals first thing they do is they charge a processing fee because they also have their own expenses that they have to look at. But this particular uh, question about uh, being asked to 
pay for publication, I think quite often you find this as a problem in predator journals. Now, predator mm -hmm. journals are notorious for the they 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 lure you into uh, sending your article, accepting it, and then suddenly uh, they put this bombshell. You have to pay so much to get it into print. Of course, they will do it very fast and things like that. But then there is all this, and also. Uh, from an academic and scientific point of view, they really do not have any proper standing. Then there are reputed journals uh, where, uh, again, you have to pay a certain amount of money uh, to this thing. Not that many, actually, but there are a few. Then, of course, there are the very high-impact journals where even to read that journal uh, or at least read some uh, portions of it, you need the subscription. So there are a lot of commercial interests in this. Um, in fact, there is one very reputed journal where, uh, with a extremely high impact factor where uh, I, I used to read that it was open access till very recently. Uh, well, a couple of years now, I think. And then they, they made it that it's subscription only for certain uh, for most of the articles. And I'm generally having a running fight with them, trying to say that give it to, at least give that open access facility to some of us from the developing countries because we cannot afford it. So, you know, there are so many commercial interests, but of course we must keep in the back of our mind that journal mm -hmm. running, producing a journal also involves monetary mm -hmm. considerations, that uh, there is a certain amount of money that you have to spend. So I think the, the lesson that the audience needs to take note is you need to avoid uh, predatory journals and you need to be aware of all these predatory journals out there. So before you actually submit your manuscript or else they will yeah. hold it to you as a hijack and will not, uh, you know, you've got to pay some money just to get your papers published and you realize that you're, you're publishing in, in, in not a very uh, good standing journal. Quite the next so. question, the ne yeah, the next question I have uh, from the participant is on uh, responsible conduct of research and ethical publishing practices, basically on authorship dispute. So how do you uh, avoid authorship dispute? What are the, the methods that you can do to make sure that the authors of the papers actually are in the papers? That um, Again, a uh, 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 very difficult problem sometimes comes up from time to time. Um, it is entirely up to the authors. Uh, now, there are all types of authorships that are described, like ghost authors, guest authors, all types of things are described. But uh, quite sadly, sometimes um, uh, an author who actually deserves to be listed as an author um, is denied uh, that facility of being an author of a paper. So there are all kinds of disputes. But we have gone to the extent in at least the Sri Lanka mm -hmm. Journal, uh, uh, Journal of Child Health, where we have actually laid down uh, the conditions that uh, would be satisfied before a person can be declared uh, an author. And that specifically sort of uh, stresses that, uh, that it, is, it is not basically not nice to deny a person who had done perhaps all the work. Uh, and this sometimes happens in academic environments, unfortunately. Um, and um, the authorship disputes become a real problem then after that, because once a paper has been accepted, then somebody writes and says, look, I also was involved. I did this much of work. And then we had to write to the papers or the, the, the corresponding author and go through a whole rigmarole of things. But then as editors or the editorial board, we cannot really decide on who should come in or who shouldn't come in. And then there is also, there can sometimes be disputes about the order in which the names are signed. Um, now, generally, as a very general rule, uh, uh, you become the principal author is listed as the first person who had done the most amount of work and the most senior person who has overseen all the work generally or the head of the institution or all that comes in as the last person. I mean, these are very general rules. Um, uh, but uh, now in certain academic institutions, 
uh, when there are multiple author papers that they have to decide on number of points that are given uh, how much credibility is given uh, how much um, how much of uh, uh, positive things are given to different authors so if the total amount of um, points that are allocated to a paper is 5 and there are 10 authors now how are you going to divide this Uh, so these are problems that you have now in Sri Lanka. Really, we have a, a very strict marking scheme uh, for publications for academic advancement, pro professorships, senior pro senior professorships, uh, uh, senior lectureships, uh, all these kind of thing. So it's very important, and that they they be transparent. And also, when you divide a divided um, uh, amount of marks for this. you can actually add a line to say this is justified so these are all real problems in this scenario but as editors it it becomes sometimes very difficult for us to sort out these disputes uh, we can only suggest certain things but if they don't um, don't agree uh, that uh, the uh, the principal author or the corresponding author will ultimately decide on uh, which way it should go Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. BJC. I think this is something that uh, researchers who are listening in should also take into consideration, maybe before or, or during the project that is being done, uh, decide on this authorship so that you don't have you don't fall into this authorship dispute once the paper has been written. And I also like to thank uh, Emma who has shared a uh, uh, program or, or what's called a plagiarism. dot com for those who would want to check for plagiarism. So thank you very much, Emma, and for all the audience. You can also have a look. Uh, you can also share things at a chat box so that it will benefit everyone. Dr. BJC, I have another question for you from the audience. Uh, now this question is on a uh, negative result. Is it still worthy to publish negative results? Of course, I have agreed. I have this. I have sort of always said. uh that certain types of negative results are very important um because um now this is one of the things uh, that have come to light basically when there are certain types of vested interests i am not i am not being any more specific than this because people always think that these are the positive results but it is scientifically extremely important when something that has had so much of positive impact on your uh, practice especially especially in medicine because this is particularly important for for medical journals uh, that if someone has a very good study where there are certain negative effect i would think as an editor that that would be equally important because that may be the first report of something a little bit strange going on and um, the uh, i i also uh, believe that uh, uh, something my my uh, virtually venerated um, uh, guru in uh, editor editor's work uh, uh, professor stella di silva unfortunately she is no more uh, with whom uh, at her feet that i learned the basics um that she used to always say you know you know, look, when you look at a paper if something looks a little bit fishy it invariably is so that is one ex ex extreme example of weird and in fact now there are there are documented uh, instances of non existent papers which have even been quoted in high impact journals but then here we are talking of a slightly different thing because the, the thing that has been accepted almost as a norm over the years and you suddenly come across a paper where there is a negative impact i think that is as important as the positive one thank you very much uh, this is the last question from the audience uh, this is regarding uh, i think someone who has had many uh, experience in publishing Uh, he is asking um, this uh, regarding peer review process in general. In your opinion, Dr. BJP, BJC, is it is is it a censorship or is it a necessary evil or does it actually help to improve the quality of your manuscript? 
once again, ob obviously somebody who has had a lot of obligations because we have all had um, um, various problems with different types of peer review. And obviously, I think most pe most authors now know that that uh, there are different forms of peer review. Uh, there are open peer review, there are selected peer review, there are blind peer review. Uh, and in fact, in uh, the two journals where I, most of my work is involved in, we have uh, a double blind peer review. Uh, if the peer review, one of the problems is, uh, the initial problem about peer review is getting good, decent reviewers to do the peer review. They're not very easy to track down and uh, convince because many people are so very busy because a good review takes time. You may have to go back into the literature and look up certain things before you do a decent review, right? So it takes a lot of time. And also uh, there are, unfortunately, there are reviewers, um, how shall I put it? Um, who may have personal interest in 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 the, the 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 research that invariably because sometimes the the paper is of such specialist quality that it is sent to another specialist who is also involved in similar work so there are all kinds of things that can happen but as the 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 person who asked the question quite rightly said uh, that Unfortunately, it is a necessary evil which gives credibility to the work that is being accepted for publication. But as far as editors go, we are responsible for the published public record. And the peer review process is a very important uh, cog in this wheel of ultimate publication of the paper that is being submitted. So, but then having said that, once you have got the reports of the, uh, the reviewers, the editorial board and the editors themselves have to very critically evaluate the review that has been done. So they are, uh, you know, having gone through all this, sometimes mm -hmm. we can spot certain, um, maybe uh, a little bit of, uh, irregularity, something fishy that is going on. Uh, and with all due credit to my guru, that if something sounds a little bit fishy, even from a reviewer, it is likely to be invariably fishy. So, necessary evil, but uh, do we have anything better than that? A peer review is now considered by most people. I mean, even the journals are classified as, as, as peer-reviewed journals, that gives it a, a kind of a benchmark uh, that is uh, thought to be uh, quite high in the hierarchy. So with that, it unfortunately or fortunately, is a necessary evil. Thank you, Dr. BGC. Thank you so much for all your insights. That's most valuable. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers. Uh, that was such an amazing presentation, amazing sharing. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure all the audience have too. And it is uh, it was a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Colin Bins, Professor Lo Wai Yun, Dr. BJC Pereira. It, it's it's, it's uh, most tremendously amazing uh, information sharing that we've had just now. Um, so uh, to the audience, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, to conclude this seminar, this webinar, uh, I hope you've all enjoyed uh, and learned from all the three presentations and sharing, and of course sharing from the chat book, a uh, chat uh, box as well. And thank you for those who have shared all your um, sites and information for all the audience here. And on behalf of the APEC committee and our presenters today, thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Stay safe always and hope to see all of you in person next year. And Prof Lau, I think your qualitative actually picked up a lot of uh, people who are wanting a, a, a seminar, a full seminar on qualitative uh, module. So thank you so much, everyone. And okay. thank you, uh, Madam, um, Madam um, uh, uh, Coordinator. Um, as I said before, it was an honor and a privilege for me. 
and also to meet the other two excellent presenters. Maybe what we can have is get everyone to on their, uh, their yes, camera, think, uh, and we can actually have yeah, a, a has, photo uh, session. Off his mic. Yeah, I think can everybody on your video, please, for yeah. a camera session for a photo session. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, while waiting for everyone to on their cameras, uh, maybe it's the presenters, would you like to say anything last words, Prof. Colin? Uh, well, I think that following uh, BJC's presentation, you'll get a better understanding of some of the difficulties that an editor faces. As I said before, we get probably this year over maybe around about a thousand submissions by the end of the year, and we will only be able to publish about a hundred full length papers and a few more letters and short communications. So it's a difficult job. What we are interested in in our journal is things which will improve the health and well being of the people in our region. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we want all new and innovative ideas, although they're very helpful, but we want things which will work. And so if you've got papers, please send them to us. Thank you, Prof. Colin. Prof. Lau? Yes, uh, right. Uh, at every APEC conference, uh, we have this uh, scientific writing workshop as a pre-conference workshop. So uh, next year, it will be held in Sri Lanka. Uh, at the Shringla Hotel, um, I think in October next year. So again, we will have uh, you know a pre-conference uh, writing workshop again. So we do encourage all participants, you know, if you can, do submit articles to uh, our journal. But most important of all, to cite papers that are published in our journal. Thank you, Dr. BJC. Last words from you. Uh, well, very last words. Oh, I, I just want to stress that what a wonderful experience it was. To take part in this but then um, now having said that uh, people always say that um, you know in-person conferences are, are the, the the real thing but it is not so i think the way the new world is developing i think it has been a wonderful experience and thank you so much for everything and for the organizers thank you very much everyone Thank you, presenters. Thank you, everyone. So I think this is, uh, I, I hope the organizers um, on the other side have already taken our photo. Is the photo taken? Uh, Secretary. 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 Prof. Indika. Photo's taken? Yeah. Well, I have the, the, the guy sort of very close to me, sort of at the back of the auditorium. Uh, he says that all the photos have been taken. So no problem all right. at all. Okay, so yeah, you're actually physically there. Yes. That's, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. Okay. I needed some of his help as well, you know, to get things organized yes. as well. Okay, then. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Goodbye, Bye. everybody. Bye. Have a, have a nice Stay day. Stay safe, everyone. Bye -bye. Stay safe.